Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, our event. Today, we have um, the second Raising Awareness event of the Lead for FNSSA project, Driver and Dynamics of Creating an Enabling Environment for the FNSSA Platform. Uh, my name is Nurhana Dalel. I'm the project manager at the e Egypt EU Cooperation Unit um, at the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research in Egypt. Um, and I will be moderating the sessions today, the very informative and interesting sessions that we have ahead. But first, let me introduce you uh, to the event and walk you through the agenda of today. Uh, this event is a second of a series of raising awareness events. The first one was held last November. Um, and uh, this event will support the implementation of the EU-Africa Research and Innovation Partnership on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture. So in order to establish a sustainable platform as described in the roadmap, synergies and coherence between stakeholders must be augmented. And that's why we are here today. To establish such a network and a, co a collaboration mechanism between the diverse stakeholders from both continents, uh, this demands tailoring of the partnership to identify intersection and create synergies between the strength and needs of these entities. The discussion of today is based on the results of previously uh, workshops. Uh, the first one is the West Africa workshop, which was held in last October. And the other event was the first raising awareness event uh, that was held in November. And the outcomes that I will present to you right away serve as the base for the discussions that we will have today. Um, just one hint, uh, the discussions of today we also feed in another important event that we will have by the end of June, which is the second dissemination event, and we will tell you about it later. So the, the West Africa workshop that took place last October, um, it initiated the process towards creating a West African alliance that would feed in into the overall coordination platform that we are aiming at. Uh, part of the event was exposing young entrepreneurs to investors, scientists, and political decision makers to engage in the involvement of the business and develop partnerships in the field of FNSSA. The main findings of this event or the main uh, outcomes that we got from this event could be categorized into stakeholder involvement, the governance of the partnership, and communication and function contributions. For the stakeholder involvement, most of the um, attendees and speakers of the event suggested that there is an important role of entrepreneurs in fostering knowledge, establishing farmers cooperatives is really essential, and focusing on capacity building and skill transfer is also one key um, step towards creating this partnership. For the governance of the partnership, um, it was mentioned that it should be based on enhancing the public-private partnership and strengthening collaboration between actors across the value chain and uh, creating innovation hubs as engines of change. For the communication of the platform itself, the um, suggestions were creating database or platforms of agri-contents and focusing on opportunities at the regional level, such as scaling up of agro-production across value chain, access to data, equipment and inputs, market access and funding. Um, the other event that was held was the first raising awareness event. It was held last November. Uh, the aim of the event was to propose methods for increasing the resilience of rural areas to withstand crises similar to COVID and low costs and other crises facing the region. Uh, the aim was also to promote full implementation of an inclusive FNSSA platform and to discuss the role of an inclusive model in overcoming such challenges. Similar to the previous categories, the outcomes were also in the same uh, areas and focus. For the stakeholder involvement, uh, the suggestions were to establish a network and a collaboration mechanism of institutions, private sector, and funders, and mechanisms that includes all stakeholders from both continents. Participation of youth and women in policy dialogue, reaching out to European and African entrepreneurs. For the uh, framework of the partnership, Again, the growing importance of the private sector investment and trade, um, applying a participatory approach to ensure that the mandates are met, uh, co-creating the research agendas um, between both continents as well. And for the communication and functional contributions, um, several um, opinions were made that we should avoid the duplication with existing initiatives 
and uh, we should actually build on these alliances that are already there. Uh, we should also strengthen the access to financial products and um, help find more funding for scaling up the innovation, connecting European and African tech ventures focusing on agriculture, and the establishment of an integrated agribusiness hub. So back to today's event. Uh, today's event is divided into two main sessions. The first one, we will present uh, the bicontinental IRC platform that we are proposing and what is the added value of such a platform. And the second session would be on um, how the partnership, the EU-AU FNSSA R&I partnership could be a game changer and how we can move out from the usual aid paradigm to a real partnership between the two continents. Uh, now I will just walk you through the agenda of today. The first session will start immediately after I'm done, which is the added value of the bicontinental platform. We will start by uh, showing you uh, results of an open consultation that was um, done by our colleagues. And it will be presented by Carlo from CM. And then uh, just a brief on the IRC platform that we are proposing by uh, Philippe from CIRAD. And then we will have um, Marino Cavallo to present similar initiative, which is the um, SINCE project and the MADRE network scenario. And then we can find some lessons learned from such an initiative. We have also Jonas from FARA to present the achievements and challenges from the PayPart multi-stakeholder partnership. And uh, from this, we can get some um, uh, lessons learned and we can build on similar initiatives and compare what we are offering to what is already existing. Uh, afterwards, we will have an open discussion, then a short break, and we can start afterwards the second session which is focusing more on the partnership itself and the role of stakeholders in shaping such a partnership. We have our speaker uh, from FAO, Ad Freeman, who will talk about the agendas 2030 and 2063 and how food and agriculture are the center of these agendas. We have Barbaros from the EIT Food EU. We'll discuss the connecting innovation, education and business creation. We have Amr Sabahi from Sikkim Agriculture and he will focus on private sector and the involvement in such a partnership. And finally, we have Edith um, from the University of Amsterdam to discuss the knowledge co-creation in agriculture and food-related multi-stakeholder platforms. And then a final open discussion. Uh, thank you so much. I think now we can move to our first session, which is the added value of the bicontinental platform. Uh, and how it could be a support for existing frameworks and uh, advocacy lever to easily reach to EU and AU decision ma makers and present examples from the current landscape to, of existing platforms and attempt to avoid duplication. And now I present our first speaker, Carlo Sanseviero from the CM Bari. Uh, he's a communication officer with a degree in linguistic and intercultural mediation from La Sapienza University in Rome and Political Science International Relations, Aldo Moro University, Bari, short master in immigration, law and inclusion practices uh, from Aldo Moro University as well, and a certificate in translating communication of the European institutions. So the floor is yours, Carlo. Thank you, Nora. I just want to ask you if I can manage the, the presentation. I cannot share my screen. You should be able to share it. I don't know. No, the host has to allow you to share your screen. Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, sorry for that. Don't worry. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay. So today I will present the results of the open consultation that we launched on the 12th of April. 
and it was closed one month later. So the, the survey, so the open consultation was aimed to collect feedback on possible action to build a brand new Europe, Africa, multi-stakeholder platform. This platform will bring together research and innovation efforts and investments in the field of FNSSC as described in the AU-EU high-level policy dialogue roadmap. The survey was addressed to the main actors of FNSSC, in particular to six stakeholder categories, funders, decision makers, research and innovation institutions, capacity building institutions, farmers, and consumers. The open consultation was structured as follows. From question one up to question three, uh, was dedicated to respondents profiling, so general information. After that, in the question four, respondents were asked to indicate which of the six stakeholder categories they represent. According to their choice or to their category, they were asked to express the level of agreement about some services that the platform should provide. Their agreement is, was rated with a Likert scale from one strongly disagree up to five strongly agree. The last question, question six of the questionnaire. In this question, respondents were asked to express the level of agreement about the factors that can ensure the future sustainability of the platform. This question was common to all the stakeholders category. And also in this case, the, agree the level of agreement was rated with a Likert scale from one to five. We launched the questionnaire, the open consultation through two different channels. The first one on the lib for fnssa official web website and the Agora and the social media for the wider public. And on the other side, we send direct email for key respondents that we selected within our contact database. So we collect more than 500 responses from the wider public and about 90 responses for the key respondents. These two graphs show the, the difference according to gender of the two groups of respondents. The two samples, why the public and key respondents show to be comparable in terms of male-female ratio. In these two graphs, there is the difference for uh, both for why the public and the key respondents according to region. Most why the, why the public's respondents belong to North Africa, while the group of key, state, key respondents is more focused on Western Africa. Okay, in these two graphs, it's possible to see the composition of the two samples according to the stakeholder cat categories. The two samples are perfectly comparable in terms of distribution of stakeholder categories. And it is important to underline that the most common answer came from research and innovation institution, both for the weather public and for the key respondents. Okay. With the question five, the question five was dealing with the, the, the specific session of the stakeholder category. And we asked to the respondents to express the level of agreement about this, these services that the platform should provide. In blue, you can see the answers of the wider public and in orange, the answers of the key respondents. Key respondents selected as the most important service access to startups, innovators, profiles, and ideas, while, while the public select easy access to information about different actors' profiles in research and innovation. The two groups did not respond homogeneously, homogeneously in relation to the most important services. This is the section dedicated to the decision makers. These slides are aimed to underline the, the difference between the two groups of respondents, key respondents and wider public. In this case, wider public select access to catalog of funding opportunities as the most important services, while key respondents updated FNSSA country profiles. In this case, the two groups 
expressed high enough scores and converging views about the services to be provided by the platform. Research Innovation Institution, in blue, the responses from the wider public, and they select offers and opportunity for mobility and connectivity. And in this case, the two groups, groups of respondents select exactly the same services. Key respondents also consider three other services, among others, as being important. Capacity building institution category. For the wider public, the most important services were training requests and opportunities, situation analysis and foresight, and multi-stakeholder communication mechanism. It is important to underline that also in this case, key responded select the same services. The two groups express a very similar preference for nearly all proposed services, as you can see in this slide. Farmers, the wider public select information on funding opportunities as the most important services. And also, in this case, key respondents were in agreement with the wider public. They both express the preference for the same service. The last one, stakeholder category, was the one dedicated to the consumers. And in this case, while the public select disseminating research outputs on FNSSA and assess to healthy food at low price or negative markets, while key respondents respond homogeneously, unanimously, a specific service that is repository of information on local foods. The question six was dedicated to the factors that can ensure the sustainability of the platform in the future. This question was common to all the stakeholder categories. And I want to focus your attention on the difference, also in this case, between the two groups of respondents, why the public and key respondents. As you can see, also in this case, they were in agreement and they were, there is no marked difference between the two groups of respondents in the choice that in, of the factors that can ensure the future sustainability of the platform. Okay, I want to conclude my presentation saying that key respondents and wider public seem to have the same approach and views regarding platform services. Only for funders category and consumers, responses were quite different. Both groups, key respondents and wider public, indicate the following services as the most important. Offers and opportunity for mobility and connectivity for research and innovation institutions. Training requests and opportunities for capacity building institutions and information on funding opportunities for farmers. Regarding the factors that can ensure the platform sustainability, both groups agree that user-friendly and accessible services, high quality of services provided and ensure Europe, Africa institution participation as the most important factors. Thank you for your attention, Nora, I come back to you. Thank you, Carlo, so much for this very interesting um, presentation on the outcomes of the survey. And I think maybe if you have any questions, we can keep them um, for the open discussion session after we have finished the, the other presentations. Um, and I think now uh, we can give the floor to Philippe. I can share my screen again. So now, um, continuing on the same uh, subject of the bicontinental IRC platform, we have Philippe uh, Petit-Hugunen, uh, the Deputy Director General for Research and Strategy, CIRAD, and the Coordinator for the Leap for FNSSA project. Uh, he was trained as a farming system agronomist and has been working in the field 
of agriculture research and development for over 35 years, including 20 of posting in Africa and Latin America. He has uh, extensive experience on linking research and development process in trop tropical farming systems and value chain approaches. He also worked for the European Commission for three years in Brussels advising DGRTD on activities of international cooperation and is currently the deputy director for research and strategy at CIRAD France and a member of uh, several uh, European um, and international working groups and he's also in particular uh, working uh, at the EU Africa HLPD SCI working group and food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture on innovation and he's currently coordinating our project, the H2020 project T for FNSSA, on the partnership between Europe and Africa uh, on agricultural research. So uh, back to you, Philip. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Noran. So I will, um, I think, go briefly about the uh, LIPO FNSSA project to just to uh, focus mostly on what has been uh, the topic of this, this discussion, the added value of the proposed platform and, and of the, uh, the IRC model. And I will try to probably uh, build also on what Carlo has presented from this very interesting open consultation and, and the results we've just uh, discussed now. So very briefly, the um, LIB5 and SSA is, is, a, is a, a project funded by Horizon 2020, um, a coordination and support action. It's, well, more or less at the middle of the project, it started in November 20, uh, 2018, will finish in 2022. Um, and it's a 5 million euro project. Uh, next slide, please. We'll see the list of, um, of the consortium partners. It's a very uh, large consortium with 35 partners, both from, from Europe and Africa and from the different regions of, of Europe and Africa. Next slide, please. So now to, to come to the, to the main issue that we want to discuss, the Lib5 NSC as a project uh, is asked to establish what we call a, a sustainable structure or platform. Uh, and the text I'm reading is in, it appears on the slide is actually in our grant agreement. So a sustainable structure or platform for the efficient and coherent implementation of the EU, EU research and innovation partnership as described in the FNSSA roadmap. So, so what is important to, to notice uh, in here is that it has to be a structure which is sustainable, which will last for many years beyond the scope of individual project. It's a bi-continental platform linking Europe and Africa. It has a, a mandate linked to the FNSSA roadmap, the roadmap which has been approved by the EU and the AU. And as such, uh, this platform will also be a link between the policy dialogue that exists between the two unions and the activities on the ground. Next slide, please. The added value of that, that proposed platform, uh, I think resonates very well with a number of, of, um, um, of results from the open consultations. So mostly three main field of activities, creating synergies between the programs, the actors, building on their experience uh, so that there is an improvement in the status of food and nutrition security and sustainability of agriculture in Africa and Europe. I mean, on both continents. So creating synergy between all this for better impact in both continents. Reducing the difficulty for identifying partners and finding appropriate fundings. And a uh, third level of activity is on boosting innovation, showcasing solution that works and, and supporting all the ideas that comes from the different category of stakeholders. And just to stop a moment here, it, it actually resonates with three main domain of activities to reach those objectives. Uh, one domain is about producing information which is tailored information, which is information required by the stakeholders in Europe and Africa. We've seen in the open consultation, for instance, uh, policymakers saying we would like to have a country profiles. This is typically a type of, of tailored information. Other was saying uh, we'd like to have information on technologies. Uh, and so this typically, this first area is producing information which is tailored made, which is responding to the expectation. I mean, 
the Open Constitution has also insisted on a second area, which is the funding opportunities. And the diversity of, his, um, of funding opportunities for capacity development, for uh, boosting innovations, for creating uh, impact at a larger scale, for supporting new research initiatives. So all this is an area where uh, the platform will develop activities to inform about funding, but also to channel funding to the different uh, participants. Uh, and funding is not only from the public sectors, there's a lot of funding and resources available also from the different stakeholder categories and from the private sectors. This was also uh, mentioned in the, in the open consultations. And the third area after information and after funding is facilitating the contact. I think in, in the open consultation, there was this um, request for partnership building, you know, facilitate, identify the good partners, and that will be also something that the platform will do because at the moment, a lot is happening. There are many programs, there are many uh, projects, uh, short term, longer term, but they are not really put in a coherent fashion. And it's quite difficult at the moment to find your way through this multitude of very rich and very um, uh, promising activities, but more synergies can, can be done. N next slide, please. So this is what we want to do with this platform and reducing fragmentation is a key issue. And today, I think uh, a lot is happening, but it's not put in coherence. Supporting interaction, so creating these synergies, improving this coordination. So all this will be uh, performed by the platform, which we are proposed to, to establish. And that platform, platform is proposed to be established in the model of what is known as an international research consortium. And, and allow me to say a few words about what is an international research consortium and what's the added value of an IRC. Next slide, please. So the, these are the, the uh, principles for establishing this uh, IRC FNSC platforms. The, the first principle is inclusiveness. The platform will be open and seek participation from institutions from all the different stakeholder categories in Europe and in Africa. It's not only for Europe, it's not only from Africa, and it's not only for researchers or not only for funders, it's for all categories of stakeholders from both continents. The second element, the second principles uh, after inclusiveness is the notion of commitment. And I think that notion of commitment is key to the sustainability of the platform. So the membership of the platform is open to all these institutions, as I've mentioned, but institutions who are looking to enhance the impact of what they are already doing. They are already doing a lot, but they think that with better alignment, better connections, better coordination, there will be greater impact. And they are willing to contribute to the roadmap, which has been approved by the EU and the AU. And, and, I, and I noticed that in the open consultation, one of the key factors for sustainability was the connection to the EU and the AU. So that's reflected here in this principle. It will be sustainable if institution commits and they commit so they are ready also to bring in their resources in cash or in kind uh, that, that they have to contribute to the progress on the world map. And of course, those institutions will commit by agreeing on some sort of document here, the, the, the little picture on the left, signing some sort of MOU, which will describe the work plan and the organization of the International Research Consortium. The third principle is about, it's not only fund, funding research, funding innovation, but we're looking at how this will have impact and as I said before, impact on both continents. Next slide, please. The fourth uh, element is the uh, co-design. An IRC, uh, and that's the beauty of the concept of International Research Consortium is that it's, there's a lot of room for maneuver in it. So how you organize it, how you design it is, is really up to the members, the institution who sign in and, and create it. So, um, there will be, um, um, as principle in this co-design, shared responsibility between Europe and Africa, shared governance also 
between the different institutions who are supporting the, the roadmaps. And in this issue of the co-design, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to uh, what uh, uh, Marino Cavallo and Jonas Mugabe will present and also the discussion because all this is the co-design will feed from the lesson learned and from other uh, good examples. Uh, the sixth principle, the fifth principle is, is pragmatism. Uh, we know that building a, a platform which is ambitious like this one will, will take some time, uh, but we want to uh, make it start as initiates because we think, you know, the, you make the way in the walking. So through that, we start establishing a platform with institutions who are willing to do, willing to do it and, and to launch it, but keep it open, keep it adapted to learning from experience and then expanding from this. And that's feed naturally from the, the, the sixth principle is the sustainability and adaptability are linked. I mean, this platform a, will be established for the long term, thanks to the commitment of its funders but also thanks to the fact that it will continue to adapt and provide services. I mean, I, I saw that in, in the open consultation, two high elements coming where the platform has to deliver services which are user-friendly. So we have to be adaptable to deliver on something which is user-friendly, but also the high quality of services uh, provided. If the services providers are of high quality, and for this we probably will need to develop, learn, and adapt, then the, the platform will be sustainable because there will be value in becoming maintaining your commitment to this platform. Next slide, please. So this is just a very uh, a short uh, summary of what is an IRC, a group of committed institutions including research and innovation institution, but not only. Institution will agree formally, so there is some sort of document that, that they sign. Uh, they agree to work jointly in alignment for the mid to long term. So maybe it starts with like a five-year MOU, but then can be uh, uh, prolonged uh, for, for more, more, uh, more years, as long as the members uh, want. But it, it's focused on the goal. And I think uh, here we see the, the target. The goal is creating impact on both continents in the implementation of the FNC roadmap. Next, next slide, please. And just continuing with summary, it will be a shared governance. So this is very open for the discussion and the co-design and we welcome all ideas for this. All the activities will be implemented by the members uh, together. And for that, they will use resources that they, as members, bring in, but also resources that will come from other sources, and especially funders. And, and the good thing about the, uh, this initiative, this IRC platform, it, it is really uh, uh, supported by the EC and the AUC. So the support of the EC will, be, uh, will also come as in addition to the resources of the members. Next slide, please. So to summarize the, the added value of building this platform as an IRC, first one is this notion of funders' commitment that will ensure its sustainability as long as they see value in it. An IRC is a instrument is a construction which is welcomed by the European Commission, but is not as restrictive as an European Commission instrument, so you can adapt it and you can work in it and make it your own, as you see it, uh, important for the thematic. The third added value is that there are well-known examples of IRC who have been working for many years, continuing working successfully and being able to attract support from independent funders. The flexibility of the IRC, we can build on what exists. So this uh, discussion today is very important, building on what exists, building on past experience, and adapt to what the founders of the IRC platform will want. There are various options for governance, and, and that can be uh, discussed in the co-design phase. So very, very open. 
Uh, it, it enables to have a, an equal access for EU and non-EU institution, or in our case, especially institutions from Africa, but they could also be institutions beyond Europe and Africa who are interested to, to join. And uh, it is called an international research consortium, but of course is with a broad vision of research and all the innovation chain is, is uh, embarked in what an IRC platform can do. Next one, uh, Noran. So maybe just to, to conclude, uh, if uh, people who are listening uh, at the moment uh, are wondering, can we join this IRC? Yes, I would say all institutions from Europe and Africa and beyond who are looking for this enhanced impact of their activities, who are willing to contribute to the ambitions of the roadmap which has been approved by the EU and the AU, who are ready to mobilize their own resources towards this roadmap, but also to help secure resources coming from other funders, who will be happy to sign on the uh, constitution of the platform, its work plan, its organization, and take part in its activities. I mean, all these institutions are, are welcome to, to join. If it's the case, next slide, please. You may, you may wonder uh, when to start. So at the moment, we will uh, launch a, a call for expression of interest. So we will let you know. You can also already also contact us at the project. You can look at the, uh, on our website, uh, www.leap4fnssa.eu, and you will know more uh, about it. But then when we have collected expression of interest, we will reach to you to see how together we can work in co-building this, uh, this platform. I uh, thank you for this, uh, for listening and I am up, open to questions and back to you, Noren. Thank you, Philippe, so much for this um, very informative presentation on the RSC platform. I think now it's clear to everyone what we are aiming at at the project and what exactly uh, do we mean by the IRC FNSSA platform and what we are expecting um, to achieve in the coming years. And uh, I think we already have some questions, but I would prefer if we move forward with the presentations and then have an, an open discussion at once. And uh, I think this is a good chance that we can have uh, Marino now present and afterwards Jonas to uh, describe their experiences with similar initiatives and uh, reflect on your presentation and on Carlos' presentation as well. Um, I so, uh, now I, yes, yes, Marino, I just I would like to present you to everyone here. Um, Marino uh, worked for over 20 years in local and territorial authorities in Italy. Uh, he achieved knowledge and experience about public administration, innovation processes, projects to stimulate local and regional development. And also he started uh, successful activities for the managing of European projects and programs of interregional cooperation between different countries of EU. He is the head of department research, innovation and management of EU projects in the metropolitan city of Bologna, Italy. And during the last 10 years, he was adjunct professor in the University of Bologna, Italy and University of Ferrara. He's also a journalist and had collaborations with newspapers and academic and professional reviews. He delivered courses and speeches in important European universities at the Sorbonne, the Charles University, Leipzig, and Lund University in Sweden. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you today, and the floor is yours now. Many thanks. I try to share my presentation. Can you see my presentation now? Can you see? Yes. yes. Okay, full screen. So, uh, first of all, I think uh, your initiative is really important. Uh, our experience in this sector show how the interest and the effectiveness of such kind of platform. So we are interested also to join to this platform and to share information 
and content for the platform you are uh, you are working in. Can you just put the presentation in full screen mode? Yes. Yeah. Now is the full screen the presentation. Yes, um, the my presentation in focus focused on the relationship between uh, circular economy and uh, agri-food sector and urban agriculture. We have uh, many projects in these fields, and I think this is a really strategic area of work of uh, our organization and uh, of uh, other organization, important organization in Europe. In the last uh, year, we work uh, on a project uh, about the urban agriculture to support uh, the urban agriculture and the capacity building in the agriculture sector, in innovative area of agriculture sector. Our project were, uh, were founded by the Interreg Mediterranean um, pro program of the EU, uh, pro Project Madre and Project Sesame, in this case uh, founded by the uh, Erasmus Plus uh, program of the uh, EU. Uh, and uh, we have also in uh, this period project in the sector of the circular economy in general for the small and medium enterprise Chesme project founded by Inter Europe uh, program of you and uh, specifically on the agro food sector since project uh, and uh, this project is uh, really important for the for the topic of today because uh, the role of the platform is uh, is a strategic in this kind of work. We focus on the, we try to, to insert this activity also in the global scenario of the, of the sustainable development goal, goal and uh, we, are, uh, we are we are engaged in this uh, in this objective with uh, a metropolitan strategic agenda and with several activities in the sector of the reuse of food. The Bologna is the city of food, as you know, but uh, it's important also the innovation in the supply chain of food in the different phases, in the harvesting, in the transport, in the storage, and in the processing of the, of the food and of the, of the layout of the supply chain. And uh, in this way, we uh, are able to achieve and to contribute to the important uh, aims of the Sustainable Development Goal of the United Nations. Uh, Sorry, Marino, can you just raise your voice a little bit? I think some of the attendees cannot hear you well. Can uh, you okay, I can, uh, I can try to, to talk with them. Um, okay. Um, Bologna commitment uh, against the food waste is a really important activity in the last uh, year. Uh, we seen the, the Bologna chart against the food waste in uh, Milan during the Expo in uh, the 2015. And uh, we decided to engage our organization, our activity to fight the food waste and the problem related to this, also in a, a perspective of circular economy. Another important uh, uh, commitment of our organization is related to the promotion of local pro product, zero kilometer uh, uh, supply chain, and the promotion of the local market. We have important experience in this field, for example, Mercato Ritrovato in the center of Bologna. And this is an example of promotion of local product, but also a way to regenerate a district of a city and a neglected area of our, of our neighborhood using the, the impact of the local farm, farmer in the social relation and the, in, the, in, the, in the communication of the people that is that are uh, working or living in uh, some area of, uh, of the city. Uh, as you know, uh, maybe the last minute market is an initiative of uh, Bologna, uh, of the University of Bologna. 
and is an important uh, program uh, has been uh, carrying out most recovery services for large scale retail trade and they achieved important results also in terms of, uh, of uh, impact on the, on the supply chain. Uh, now, last name of market manager, uh, 350 stores and over 400 third sector entities cooperate with last minute market. They recover 55,000 cooked meals, food products uh, worth uh, over 5 million, and uh, drugs uh, for 1 million, and uh, more than 1,000 of tons of not food product. Uh, are uh, managed by this organization. And uh, this is important uh, uh, activity of this organization that give also the possibility to, uh, to create a new legislation about, uh, to facilitate them for the simplification of the activity of the reuse of food. This is an important, an important area of, uh, of work of our organization, but also an example of how a local project can, uh, uh, can uh, give important results at a national and European level, level uh, thanks to the, the contribution to the new, to the innovation of the, <coughs> innovation of the legislation in this, in this, uh, in this sector. As I already mentioned, it's important the role to uh, manage all these activities, these important activities in the agri-food sector, in the food sector, is important the role of the platform, of the digital platform. Uh, the project we are working in this period since project is a project uh, focused on the, on the circular economy, where the basis of the, of the exchange of uh, experience of the partner cooperating is, uh, is based on the digital platform we created. So I think this uh, could uh, really uh, present a high value in the, in the work of the different organizations in Europe. And I think in, uh, also in, uh, in the case of the platform of your organization, to invest in a platform could uh, really enhance the possibility of huge impact of your project. Uh, since there is a project uh, on the circular economy in the, in the agri-food chain to improve the, the agri-food chain and to insert in this uh, chain the, the key element of the, of the circular economy perspective is a project um, ongoing. Uh, start, we start in uh, 2019 and we will finish in 2023 with the action plan of the project, a uh, budget of over 1 million of euros and uh, organization and entities uh, uh, in the different parts of Europe, in the south of Europe, in the east and in the north of Europe. For Italy, of course, um, uh, the partner is the metropolitan city. We try to analyze the main supply chain of the circular economy in the, in the food sector. So we consider biomass, uh, biofertilizer, biofuels, and biorefinery. And all the impact of uh, this uh, uh, principle of circular economy in this uh, supply chain in agri food sector. Uh, the main activity are focused on the production, the reduction of the environment footprint of the resources, the sustainable use of water, the exploitation of the residues, the alternative market, and but also on the process in industrial symbiosis, for example, we attempt to, to, to create pilot in the agri-food sector. We already worked on the industrial sector, but also in the agro-food sector is important the, the principle of the industrial symbiosis, exploitation of bosses, sustainable packaging, and other important projects in this field of the, of the agro-food sector. And as already mentioned, the, the, the food supply. Uh, to avoid mega pack chains, the promotion policy, the marketing, food saving activities, uh, etc. And of course, it's important the role of the consumers the cons to change uh, 
to try to learn a new way to approach the consume to the consumers and uh, try to change the perspective and the and the concrete uh, daily behavior of the consumer because this could really really um, give, give us positive uh, impact on the on the on the food uh, on the food quality and the food process. The key output of the SIM project will be to involve uh, over 300 uh, stakeholders, key stakeholders of, uh, of the agro-food sector in local stakeholder group at regional and local level in, uh, in all the country involved in the process. Uh, this because it's in a, in a concrete attempt to to use the methodology of the entrepreneurial discovery process proposed by you for the involvement of the stakeholder and to give and to empower the role of the stakeholder in the in the policy. Of course, we have also tools for this dissemination, ebooks, and action plan to to give us an integrated perspective to our work. And all these uh, activities are strictly related to the use of the digital platform and the digital platform is the way to exchange all this information to capitalize all the results of our project. Pro, uh, project. For example, the learning process, we, have, we now are working to, to update the, the debates of the good practice we will put in this platform all the action plan of our project and all the policy instruments developed during the, during the since project period. Uh, we are now working on the, a couple of uh, good practice, innovative good practice. I think it's important in this phase to think to the circular economy, not only uh, related to to single single organization, but at territorial level. So we are now working to define the guideline for the biological district in the, in the area of Bologna, in the mountain area of Bologna. And now we are developing developing action about this. And also we are trying to create with the, with the things a relationship with the Italian platform of the circular economy, where the key role in this uh, process, in this in this platform, is uh, a role, the role of the stakeholder of the different organization, also private and NGO organization, uh, to share information, knowledge, experience in a platform. In this case, a platform devoted to the circular economy, and we try to manage a specific section of this platform. Uh, focused on the issues, key issues of the of the of the agro food sector. The platform was created by the National Energy Agency of Italy. Okay, something else about Madre. In this case, uh, uh, we focused in this project. Also, in this project, the key role is the role of the platform we created. Uh, in this case, we focus on the, on the metropolitan agriculture, metropolitan peri-urban uh, peri agriculture, because uh, we think that uh, now we are in a phase where the role of the agriculture, the role of the city uh, is changed. And uh, we can try to define a new kind of smart city where the linkage between agriculture and uh, urban uh, environment uh, could be really innovated by the innovative uh, tools and innovative approach to the agriculture. So we try to explore these uh, issues, these key issues, with the partnership in uh, in the Mediterranean part of Europe. So we involve. Uh, uh, France, Italy, Spain, Albania, and Greece in this uh, in this important project of um, of uh, the Med uh, Interreg Med program. Also, in this case, the 
the key result of the project are related with the exchange of good practice, with the exchange of knowledge, with the capacity building of the different city cooperating in the in the field of the agriculture and trying to to create new relationship between uh, urban and rural uh, environment. Uh, as you know, of course, uh, the urban um, urban urban uh, areas are really important. Over three billion of people will live in urban areas uh, by the 2050, and uh, so strategic the management, the good management on the local food system and the short uh, chain of uh, use of food. And so we try to, to, to organize and to work in this, uh, in this topic in, uh, in our project. Um, so I don't know if I have uh, more time or I go to the conclusion. And if you uh, give me a feedback about uh, about the time I can uh, use for my presentation. Yeah, I, I think you just have a couple of more minutes if you. A like. couple of minutes, so I try to conclude. Uh, so, with uh, the specific objective of this project, uh, we try to improve the 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 role of the metropolitan and peri-urban agriculture in this city and try to understand how the agriculture can really and concretely contribute also for the, uh, to revitalize the, the area of the city and create a new relationship and to play also a social role for the improvement of the city and the creation and new concept of smart city where the role of the sustainability is uh, a key role also also in uh, in the Mediterranean uh, in the Mediterranean city, um, we identify some uh, key topic uh, to create the strategic action plan of the next year. For example, the the the, the new farming technique of organization, the new marketing pattern. For the, for the farmers and new tools for the promotion of the local product, the, the issues of the consumers' innovation, for example, the citizen initiative and how involved the citizen in initiative of, uh, of urban, uh, urban agriculture, uh, the, the role of the academic for the study and for the analysis and for the research, the territorial level and the role of the metropolitan city and the metro, Mediterranean Euro, uh, metropolitan city to promote this new kind of agriculture and this new kind of involvement of citizens of the different countries of Europe in pro, project uh, focused on the agriculture, the social innovations, so the relationship between between the the social inclusion of, uh, of vulnerable population of the city using the, the agriculture and the project related to agriculture and the transnational innovation and the role of the digital platform and the role of the exchange of experience based on the digital platform. Uh, these are the key topic developed in this project and uh, as you can see in Bologna we managed the strategic topic of the use of the platform of the use of the the creation of the networking activities to to enhance the role and to boost the role of the agriculture in this phase of our of our um, economic development so in this uh, platform, we have a catalog of best practice. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, tools and information uh, and the knowledge uploaded. Uh, another important result of this uh, project uh, is the creation of policy paper with recommendation uh, for the metropolitan governance of the met of the uh, metropolitan and peri urban agriculture action plan and an agreement between the different metropolitan city of the Mediterranean area. So we have this agreement with Marseille, with, uh, 
with, uh, with Montpellier, with, uh, with Barcelona, with Tirana, with all the, uh, all the, the, the city involved in, 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 our, in our activities. And this gives us the possibility to work and to share information and also to create and to design new projects in these in this, uh, in this areas. I think uh, I finished my time. We have, uh, if you are interested, uh, we have uh, the, some information about Madre in a spot. You have uh, here the, the reference to the, to the link to YouTube and uh, also some additional information uh, about the project uh, that are online. We prepare also uh, many research analysis and if you are interested in this research and analysis I can I can of course send you. I will be really happy and glad to cooperate with the, this new platform because we are in this phase developing developing activities with the area of the metropolitan city but we hope soon also with the area of the North Africa and uh, I think this is a strategic uh, strategic um, territorial level to work together. Many thanks for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Marino, for your presentation and for sharing your experience with the different projects and uh, network creation and platforms. I think we can really link this to what we are doing. And uh, thank you for interest for your interest in joining um, the RSC platform. Um, I think now we can move on to another uh, interesting experience, which is the PayPart uh, multi-stakeholder partnership. Uh, by Jonas Mugabe from uh, FARA. He is the, the lead specialist research policy and investment uh, forum for agriculture research in Africa. Um, he is from Rwanda and currently working uh, at FARA as the lead specialist, as I mentioned. He's also the manager of the platform for the African European Partnerships in Agriculture Research for Development, PayPart. And before joining FARA, he was working in Rwanda as the Deputy Director General for Research at the Institute of Science Agronomies of Rwanda. And his main role and responsibilities were to coordinate, integrate different research programs for a better delivery and to build the capacity of scientists, create conditions for a better partnership and mobilize financial resources. Um, he also taught uh, for almost a decade at the Faculty of Agriculture at the National University of Rwanda. And he worked with several NGOs to develop the um, eastern of the DR Congo in the southern Kivu province. He holds an MSc and a PhD in agricultural economics from the University of Zurich de Louvain and the Faculty University of Science and Agronomics um, of Gembleau in Belgium. And he also holds another master's in environment management from the University of Sangor in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, the floor is yours, Jonas. You can take it from here. Okay, thank you, uh, Nora. <laughs> Jonas, I think something's wrong with the connection. So he was asking a question. You can't hear? No, now, now we Hello? can hear you. Yes, now we can hear you well. Please go on. Yeah. Ah, okay. Sorry, Some sorry for that. Sort of distortion or something. Yeah, now it's fine. Okay, okay. Thank you. I was saying that uh, I'm happy that uh, uh, the former co manager of PyPad is also in attendance in this meeting, Remy Kahane. I saw him asking some questions. Uh, can you go to the next? Yeah, if you can can scroll so that you display all. Yeah, uh, PIPAD stands for Platform for African and European Partnerships in Agricultural Research for Development. Yeah, this project has identified some pro 
problems, which are there on the left, the declining of European African ARD collaboration project concentrated in few countries of Africa, research research collaboration without including other stakeholders and research that was driven by European interests. And can you go up to the end, Nora? The end of that slide, okay, okay, go. One more. Okay, thank you. So, uh, and the last one was, it was also obvious that it was dominated by European research organizations. So, uh, PIPAD came to address all these problems and the solutions are on the right. I'm not going to, to go through all these solutions, but I'm going to focus mainly on the three last uh, solutions. One is inclusive partnerships with non-research stakeholders. It means pharma organizations, private sector, NGOs. We have also driven by demands of end users and balanced partnerships led by African non-research stakeholders. I think when Philippe was presenting the next IRC, he talked about partnership building, about inclusiveness, showing that this platform should it be dominated only by researchers, although the name is International Research Consortium, but this one is research for development. It shouldn't be understood by risk fundamental research where on research organizations will dominate the scene. It is just the name, yeah, but it has to be inclusive and I'm glad that he insisted on that one. Next, please. So these were the problem that PIPAD was meant to address. So the project was having an objective of enhanced, more equitable, more demand-driven and mutually beneficial collaboration of Africa and Europe on ARD with the aim of attaining the MDGs. At the time it was MDGs and then later on it became SDGs. So uh, PIPAD, as I said, was building equitable partnerships, one be between African and European, European partners, between research and research users, and also between public and private. So those were kind of equitable partnerships that were expected from PIPAT. And the PIPAT project was funded by DEVCO under the Food uh, Security Thematic Program, FSTP. And the total amount was 14,000, uh, 14 million, sorry, uh, euros for a period that went from 2007 up to 2018, so 11, 18 years time, which is not common with the uh, European uh, Commission project. So this one was a, an exceptional project. <clears throat> Next, please. Yeah, go, go up the end. I'm sorry for... Yeah, I'm going just to focus on the partnership here, partnership building, because we are talking about the partnership between Africans and Europeans. On the left, on green, those are African institutions. And on the right, you have European institutions. So what I can say is that 
PIPAD was a Kitabo partnership between Africans and Europeans. I'm not going to go through those work packages with their activities, but what was there was that one, uh, once a work package was led by an African organization, it was co-led by European organization. And once it was led by European organization, it was co-led by an African organization. And the management and coordination was, of course, done by FARA and Agrinatura, who are also two network organizations of research and development organizations in Africa and, and Europe. Next, please. Yeah, uh, I'm now going to the main achievement of PIPAD. I'm going just to mention four achievements, instruments that were set up by uh, PIPAD. One, of course, is the users-led process concept. This concept defines the relations between uh, researchers and pharma organizations and private sector organizations, how the group managed those relations to give the powers to farmers to define the research agenda, re define and lead the research agenda. This came through this concept of users-led process. The, the other one is competitive research fund, which was a mechanism, internal funding mechanism that was meant to fund some multi-stakeholder partnership which were facilitated by PIPADS. The other one was, and this one was for three years, Incentive fund was a, an internal, also internal funding mechanism to support the, uh, the needs that were coming quickly. Maybe if there is a call, uh, some multi-stakeholder partnership could refer to PIPAD to apply for incentive fund so that they can develop a proposal if they had a uh, need to build their capacity by using maybe a consultant, an external human resource, resource that also could be uh, applied. And these two instruments, I think they are really those who made PIPAD to be successful. And I think in the IRC, we need to think also about this kind of funding mechanism that can help to cater to, to respond to needs that can, can come in the course of the implementation. And of course, the fourth uh, instrument was communication and capacity strengthening strategies. You know that up to now, uh, PIPAD still communicates. You have been receiving, for those who, are, who have subscribed to PIPAD D Group, communications about funding, about webinars, about resources that are coming out, publications, we still share those kind of inf informations that are really needed. So these are the key achievement of PIPAD that made it successful. Next, please. Now, let us move quickly to lesson learned and challenges from the multi partnerships. The first one is that African-European partnerships needs time to build trust 
and time for cultural cultural integration. You know that uh, there is those kind of dynamics between African and European partnerships that we need to manage. And that's why when we set our objective of building the partnership up to 2022, I think the time frame is very short. Uh, we, need, we need really to have more time, uh, maybe the end of leap for FNSSA, uh, we are going to, to start the IRC, but it needs time, even for, for Piper to fly. I remember the first phase, it, it was just something like jargon, we are learning, learning, and <clears throat> we came to fly uh, after three years. So we need time to build the partnerships between Africans and, and Europeans, and also to manage the cultural differences uh, between the two continents. The second lesson learned is that communication is a catalytic element for multi-stakeholder partnership to keep the motivation in the consortium. You need, of course, to motivate people, to get them still interested. Why are they there? What are they getting from the, 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 the platform? So we need, we need to communicate to show that we are it is a living partnership. And we had some instruments, like emails, Skype, D group, blogs, or series to make effective the communication and reach out to more than 10,000 members. Currently, we are more than 12,000 members on the D group. But also, another lesson is that a coordination anchored within apex bodies. When I was showing that diagram, I said that the management of PIPAD was done by FARA and Agri AgriNatura. The two bodies have their members. So the two networks, they cover the continent. So this one is very, very important when we are building the partnership between Africans and Europeans. It is easy for PIPAD to tap in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the network. Same with AgriNatura. It is easy also when they want to inform, for example, if someone from Uganda needs a partner from, let's say, from France, it is easy to go through AgriNatura to address that issue. So the fact that the PIPAD was managed by the two bodies, the two networks, uh, continental networks, also contributed to the success of the project. Next, please. Yeah, capacity to reflect and learn together is crucial in multi-stakeholder partnerships. I think, uh, uh, when uh, Carlo was making presentation, he made also, uh, th there was a good question on uh, capacity uh, building. And I saw uh, most people are expecting that this uh, IRC will also be responding to capacity, capacity building. So uh, we are coming together, learning together, reflecting, and learn together to how to continue. Yeah, uh, and the fifth one is inadequate, inadequate funding, inadequate funding opportunities for agriculture research and innovation. You know, uh, uh, PIPAD was focusing on non-research organization. And when we started in 29, 2010, the most available funds were coming from FP7. Le, uh, this uh, uh, framework program seven, and also it was, 
providing funds to AU Research Grant Score. So it was difficult for multi-stakeholder partnership facilitated by, by PIPAD to apply for those kind of, of calls because they were more competitive, more based on excellence of proposals and less maybe on imp potential impact. So uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships and we should also anticipate even because we are building an IRC, which is a multi-stakeholder partnership, bringing some institutions which are not uh, research-based like farmers. So uh, it will be uh, sometimes difficult to, to get appropriate funds. But I think that they are coming more flexible funding, funding organizations. They are also orienting their calls towards impact. And uh, the last one, I think uh, we learned also another lesson that small funding like ARF, Applied Research Fund, which was uh, launched by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the government of the Netherlands, the Competitive Research Fund, which was internal mechanism of pipeline, the IEF, we learned that those could also trigger innovation. Innovation doesn't need really millions to come out. It is just something that engine that can trigger the start and it is gone. So I think, uh, do I have another? Or is it is just the, I think it is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your kind listening. Thank you so much, Jonas, for this um, very informative presentation and for presenting the paper at experience and the, the lessons learned and the challenges as well. I think it was really important to have you with us today and you being part of Payboard and Payboard and Lifer FNSA as well is really uh, important. I think now we can have an open discussion and um, we can have some questions. Please, if you have any question, write it in the Q&A tab or just raise your hand and we can let in uh, to speak. I think there were already a couple of questions that were answered by Philippe, uh, but maybe you can take them to the floor for discussion. If you prefer, Philippe, would you like to discuss your answers on the questions by uh, Remy and Omar? Um, concerning the relationship between the IRC and GFAR and the specific roles of FARA effort in IRC and the impact of the platform uh, in, the, in terms of sustainability beyond the project? Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Noran. I think the main, uh, let's start with the question of the, uh, the sustainability and uh, of, uh, beyond the timeline of the project. And I think what we have tried to explain is uh, uh, is a proposing to build up a platform which is built as an IRC because that's a commitment of institutions will ensure the um, sustainability of, of this platform before the timeline of, of project. We've seen with, with PayPal an interesting example, but uh, Jonas didn't say that it has been also challenging to start with uh, funding from uh, an FP7, then move to funding from DEFCO, then renew this funding. So if it's de always depending on projects, it's, uh, yeah, it's difficult to maintain the activities. Um, but if there is a commitment for institutions to, to work together and to bring, let's say, the, the basis of this working together and having a common vision, then there is interest for funders also to support the movement. So I think the, uh, uh, the creation of a platform with the commitment of a sufficient number of institutions uh, will be the first element of the sustainability. And the second one will be support from, from funders who would help this platform to, to grow, develop, and, um, and expand its activities. And I think um, the example of PayPal has, is, is rich in, in this sense. Um, the question on the um, link with uh, FARA, FR, and GFR, I tried to, to respond because uh, uh, I mean, Jonas was clear in his, in his answer that um, 
uh, Farah was one of the lead institution in, in PayPal, and I think Farah has a, a great role to play in this in the in the IRC platform. But we are at the stage where now we will want to hear from institutions whether they want to engage, whether they see this IRC platform as a, a good prospect for them. And then, um, I mean, I would very much welcome Farah to. To, to express their views and be one of the founding member of this, uh, of this platform. Um, it, it may be a bit more complicated for GFAR, which is not, which is global. Maybe not everybody knows GFAR, but global form and agricultural research. So Farah is already a member of GFAR and, and, and uh, GFAR has, uh, has a global mandate. So I think it's in discussion we would need to have with, with GFAR, but Definitely, uh, it's an institution which um, could help also to develop this uh, partnership between Europe and Africa in the context of a global vision. Our mandate is to build this bicontinental platform, uh, but addressing the SDGs also means linking to more global issues, maybe beyond the two continents. So I think that's a discussion to have with, with GFA would be, would be most, most welcome. Of course, I did not present in, in, in my presentation, I did not go in depth in, in all the activities which are developed by Leap for FNSSA to, um, to prepare this, uh, the launch of this platform. But uh, please, uh, I see there has been some comments also explaining some activities being done. And please go to the, to the website and there will be more information. Um, maybe in, um, I have more to say on, on PayPal, but maybe I'll, I'll keep these comments for, for later and maybe for, for the conclusion. Back to you, uh, Nora. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippe. Yes, as you mentioned, uh, several activities, activities were already taking place in the past two years to create this platform by all the work packages, uh, as the Stefan mentioned in the questions and comments, and um, his efforts in the West Africa region and North Africa region as well, that were the, the group's effort, I mean, in the regions. And I think maybe he just had one question at the end uh, concerning the co-design process for the platform and uh, how the existing contributions would feed in the discussion. I'm not sure if you have any comment on this. Uh, yes, no, and one of the difficulty that we have is um, um, Live for Happiness is a project and there is a consortium of 35 institutions and I'm thinking that some, some of these institutions will want to be a member of the of a platform, but that's for them to decide. And we have a sort of tricky situation where the project should not be closing the door. We should be listening to who are the institutions who wants to build up this IRC platform. And uh, it's for them to make uh, take the decisions. Our role is to facilitate, maybe to bring on the table some um, propositions, some options, especially on the uh, on the um, different type of, of governance. But in this co-design process, it has to be the future owner of a platform, the founder of it, who will have to make the decision. And maybe I should have said that this, you, as you said, not and there has been a process which has started, uh, and especially in two regions, North Africa and West Africa. Uh, and their European partners, and this will continue in the coming uh, months. And there will be uh, a, a major event uh, at the middle of next year, in 2022, probably in August 2022, uh, where actually the, the founding of a platform will gather uh, the institutions who are interested. And then that will be, um, if everything goes according to plan, the moment when the platform will be launched with its founding members. And the project will step back, uh, continuing to facilitate, uh, but step back because it's it will be those members of the platform that will take the lead. Yes, thank you, Philippe, for making this clear. I think Jonas also is trying to answer a question. If you would like to speak, uh, Jonas, instead of typing it, I think this would be better to discuss it. Uh, Jonas, can you hear me? Yes, but I went off. I'm sorry. 
It's okay. Uh, I just saw you typing and you wanted to comment on the post for paper, then you also wanted to comment on what Stefan um, added uh, on the different activities and the PIMC model that is uh, currently uh, taking place as part of the activities of creating the platform. If you want to comment on this, please go ahead. Okay, I'm not sure I got the question, <laughs> but uh, I know that uh, PIMC, we have said it many times, as it is a process which should lead normally to the IRC. Uh, as PIPAD also followed a process that led to the user's led process. The user's led process is uh, a concept that was defined in six steps. So I think PIMC also is a process that will lead definitely to the process to the IRC, which is the ultimate objective of LEAP for NSSA. I'm distracted. Okay, um, thank you, Joanna, so much for your comment. Um, I think now, uh, just to stay on time, uh, we can end this uh, very fruitful discussion and this session. And um, we can have just a quick 10 minutes break. And then uh, please don't be late for our next session, which would be uh, as interesting as the first one uh, with our uh, key speakers. And we'll see you in 10 minutes. Nora, hello? Yes. Hello? Yes, Nora. Yes, Jonas, can you hear me? Yeah. I, yes, I can hear you. Uh, I, I think I was done, maybe I just I'm sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> I was saying that the PIMC should be considered as a pathway which will lead to the IRC, which is the ultimate objective of leap for FNSSA. Yes, Jonas, I think now no, we, we heard this well, yes, it's okay. I think now everyone's on a break, but I think this was clear, it was. Okay, okay, uh, okay, that's all, no, that's no, all. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for your presentation today. It was, it was really helpful, thank you so much.
So welcome back again uh, from the break. I hope you're all back. Um, and it's time now to start our second session, the EU-AU FNSSA R&I partnership as a game changer. Uh, moving out from the usual aid paradigm to a read partnership between the two continents. In this session, the discussion will revolve around the different European and African stakeholders' roles and how they can contribute to shape the bicontinental partnership and how we can align the AUE priorities uh, in the FNSSA field based on the agendas of both partners. And this will be discussed from um, different uh, perspectives of uh, stakeholders that belong to different uh, groups. Uh, we have our sp first speaker, uh, Mr. Ad Freeman, the regional program leader uh, from FAO, the regional office for Africa. Uh, he will discuss food and agriculture at the center of both the 2030 Agenda and the African Agenda 2063. Uh, just a small introduction, Mr. Ad Freeman provides management and leadership for strategic planning, formulation, execution, monitoring, and reporting of FAO's program of work in Africa. Prior to joining FAO, he had several positions at the World Bank, including uh, in corporate evaluation, investment operations, and analytical and advisory services. He also worked in research as a senior management positions uh, within the consultative group for international agriculture research and holds a PhD in applied economics from the University of Minnesota. Uh, the floor is yours now. I think you want to share your screen. It's possible if you would prefer this. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Noran, for that. Thank you for being with us today. Introduction. Um, if you can stop sharing your screen, I will share mine. Okay, thank you so much and good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, it is my pleasure to be with you here to speak a little bit about um, food and agriculture and being at the center of both the 2030 Agenda as well as the Africa Agenda 2063. Um, we all know that these two agendas were a, a global and regional commitments that were made by political leaders um, holding the world, um, the development, the world, um, making some very clear commitments towards these goals. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, Sustainable Development Goals, as we know, these inc include um, 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, it has about 169 targets and uh, 230 um, indicators. And this integrates two other major agreements that were made in 2015, the, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, as well as the Paris Climate um, ag Agreement. And these two basically provided the, 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 the basis for the global commitments on, on development by the international community up to 2030. The AU agenda also provides a vision for Africa. And the guiding vision is for an integrated, prosperous Africa, a peaceful Africa that is driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic in the international arena. And this, as you can see and um, know, is, uh, provides a perspective of a united and a strong Africa um, in a longer term perspective. So this provides us a longer term strategy to move forward in the region. A couple of years ago, the United Nations Economic Community for Africa, ECA, looked at the 2030 agenda and the agenda 2063. They were seeking convergence. And one of the areas where they found complete convergence, 100% convergence, was on SDG2, which is the SDG that seeks to end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture, the zero hunger um, SDG. There are a couple of dimensions of this SDG. So it's common to both um, the, the 2030 agenda and agenda 2063. And this will form the basis for my um, brief um, presentation this, this morning, my time, but probably afternoon for some of you. A couple of dimensions is that um, in this two, when we look at these two global commitments, a global and a, and, a, and a continental commitment, is the fact that food and agriculture is key to realize it, to achieving the goals and objectives of these two agendas, the 2030 Agenda and Agenda 2063. 
And we all know there's ample evidence, analytic evidence, research evidence, evaluative evidence, which shows that agriculture is one of the most, if not the most inclusive tool to end poverty and hunger, because we know that agriculture is a mainstay in rural areas and the bulk of the poor people are in rural areas or involved in, in, in value chains that um, are the lower end of value chains. However, we need action. And the action to move this requires a transformation of the agri-food systems that looks at the dynamic links across the different agents, the actors, the segments, and countries in these value chains relating to specifically sustainable use of natural resources for long-term long -term productivity, a clear focus on agriculture and its related links to food and nutrition, but also looking at the resilience of agri-food systems and livelihood. These are important dynamics um, um, dimension that we have to look at when we're talking about action to move forward on, this, um, on these two agendas. This, is, uh, uh, this sort of captures the, the, the 17 SDGs. Like I said earlier on, it is um, central, not just to SDG two, but practically to all of the SDGs. However, when we look at these two agendas, there is a promise, but also there are challenges and, and the post. So let's look at the performance for, 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 for a minute and let's look at the most recent data that we have from FAO. We know that um, Africa is not on track to meet the relevant targets by 2030, particularly SDG one and SDG two as well, not just um, um, SDGs, but also within the context of the agenda 2063, the Malabo commitments, which are related to the agricultural agenda on the CADEP, we also know that Africa is not on track to meet those targets in, in the Malabo by 2025. When we look at the recent evidence in Africa, over 250 million people are hungry, they go to bed hungry every night. And this includes about 66 million people who are in acute food insecurity. They don't have enough food for a nutritious uh, um, diet. We did some recent analysis with the African Union and, and some other institutions, which identified in 2020, 15 countries that we categorize as high risk of severe deterioration of food security and nutrition, severe um, um, stress. And more recently, we also looked at healthy diets and we estimated that this is out of reach for nearly a billion people in Africa. So we do have serious challenges on, 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 in, in meeting these commitments. And here you see some of the data that we, we show. Some of these are, are, um, challenges in food systems are related to inefficiencies that seems to persist. And these relate to production and productivity. We know that in Africa, most of the growth comes from expansion of land rather than increased productivity. We also know that when we link productivity and incomes, the smallholder farmers and SMEs who tend to dominate SMEs, they're systematically um, um, recording lower productivity and incomes compared to other actors in value chains. We know there's significant leakages in agri-food supply chains. I think somebody was talking about the circular economy where we know that food loss, when we look at Africa compared to the rest of the world, we have about the highest levels of food loss in Africa, and this is compounded by the low productivity, which basically just aggravates the food supply system, food supply problems. In addition, we have severe logistic challenges in systems that drives up the cost of goods. It also puts pressure on food prices and makes inputs more expensive. And when we look at some of the key resources, water, there are significant levels of water stress, and globally, water use efficiency in Africa are amongst the lowest. We all know the, the situation over the last two years, COVID-19 has hit not just Africa, but globally, but in particular in Africa, it has already, it had made a, a food security and nutrition situation that was bad, even worse. The pandemic COVID hit when we had a really in a fragile, in the backdrop of a really fragile food security and, and nutrition situation. But even before COVID, right, over a quarter million people were hungry and like I said earlier on, over 600 million people were food insecure, meaning they didn't have access to regular access to enough nutritious food. COVID-19 has already has also aggravated all the threats to the food chains. For example, in the, in, in the Sahel region, we had extended droughts and harvest failures. And in the Horn of Africa and, the, and Southern Africa, in Eastern Africa, we had um, fall army warm and desert locusts. We devastated thousands of, 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 of hectares of croplands and pastures 
in the Greater Horn and in parts of East Africa. So it really just made a bad situation worse. At the macro level, the impact on, on economic growth, it's really worse than was earlier predicted when the, when, when the, when the, the, the pandemic hit in, in 2020. Most recent data from the IMF shows that 2020, the growth in 2020 is recorded to be among the worst on record. It's growing at a negative 1.9%. And this is leading to large increases in poverty, as I mentioned earlier on. Those numbers, we expect them to go up to 235, the 600 million, the 800 million will go up. 2021, we'll see growth, positive growth at 3.4, but this will be weaker than the rest of the world, which is about a rate of 6% predicted rate. And the projections are the recovery will happen, but it will be slow. It will be uncertain. And this is due to the lack of access to vaccines and the limited policy space to support crisis response and recovery. We know that there's no secret about this. Developed countries are vaccinating their populations at a faster rate than, 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 than African countries. And therefore, the ability for them to resume, well, the new normal, but also to resume economic activity that will lead to growth is moving at a much faster rate compared to what we see in Africa, where many, many, the bulk of the population are probably less than 1% has already even had a first shot of a vaccine compared to 20, 30% or even more in other developed countries. And that is having the space, the opportunities to, 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 to put in place robust um, response and recovery um, initiatives. Overall, this pandemic, it has become a significant threat to achieving ending extreme poverty, eradicating hunger in SDG 1, SDG 2, and in Agenda 2063. Both of those are a threat. And even the modest gains that Africa made towards achieving this agenda are being threatened. So this is a serious issue. And I think um, this sort of uh, um, forum needs to really revisit the whole issue and, and how we're going to think about the recovery going forward. However, there are bright signs. It's all not it's not all gloom, doom and gloom. Because a lot of the trends that we observe in Africa over the past 10 years, 10, 15 years and, 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 and projected do provide opportunities that we need to harness as well as challenges that we need to manage. And here are some of the examples. Productivity potential is good. We know the region can be much more productive if it gets its agri-food systems in order. There's estimations that food you know, um, um, output can increase four times. Some of the big trends that we're seeing are helping to set the agenda. For example, the food systems agenda that we see in the you know, happening in the summit, but also it providing new opportunities for change. We know that markets are growing, estimated to read about a trillion dollar in 2030. We have just started implementing the Africa continental free trade area, 1st of January. And this has a potential to increase trade by 20, up to 30% by 2040. Africa has the fastest urbanizing region and growing youth population, providing new opportunities, fresh ideas for innovation and entrepreneurship. Digital technologies are accelerating, and this is driving transformation in agri-food systems at a faster rate, leapfrogging, uh, I mean, in some particular cases, as well as advances in science and technology are generating new knowledge and providing efficient solutions. So they're bright, they're bright, um, they're, they're, they're bright sides. It's not all doom. And I think we, those of us working on development, need to pay a lot of, of attention to these trends to see how we can use them to develop um, solutions going forward. There are also what we call hidden potentials in, in, in food systems that provide significant opportunities for innovation in logistics, in storage, handling, transportation, addressing leakages, et cetera. And these provide new opportunities to enable and empower disadvantaged populations like women and men who will be disadvantaged youth. Like I mentioned, the demographic transition in Africa, produce organizations, SMEs, logistics, et cetera. So they're, 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 they're new opportunities there. And I think these are things we need to look at. So what do we need to do? The first, I think we need to, if we're gonna focus on, on Bring these two agendas that I've been asked to talk about together. There are certain things that we think we need to do as priority issues. First, we need to focus on the most vulnerable populations, particularly in landlocked countries and seeds. This is at a general level, seeds, small islands, and development states. The attention has to be on the transformation of agri-food systems, focusing on increasing productivity, like I mentioned before, diversification, more diversification, greater resilience, 
and focusing on um, interventions that are called nutrition smart. The private sector has to drive growth in the, in the region, in agri-food systems. They're the major actors there. We need to support them, including SMEs, because that is where the quality jobs are going to be created. Innovation, use of technology, digitalization, data analytics, this has to be at the core of our decision making because they will inform investment and decisions by policymakers, producers, investors, development partners, consumers, et cetera. We really need to focus on how we can get these things done. We need broader set of partnerships, have to be much more diverse, bolder, and we need a lot more. This sort of forum, I think it's a good opportunity. We also need to track progress. We need to put in place effective monitoring and evaluation systems to measure progress, take corrective actions when necessary. There has to be a, a, a greater intention to bridge what we call the missing middle. That is the middle between the globe, what is happening at the global scale and the national level, particularly on some of the capacities. I think the previous speaker was talking about some of those things, but a little bit more intentional because we know that the future belongs to the winning ideas and practices. We know that we see it happening. Countries that are innovating, knowledge economies are growing faster than others. Africa, it is positioned itself as a partner and we see a lot of innovations coming out of the continent. So Africa is not just a recipient of development aid, but actively position itself as a partner, contributing to invest innovations and action oriented solutions. We see what is happening in the, in, in the FinTech space. We see what is happening with digitalization. We see what is happening in other areas. So we really need to build on these opportunities with the startups and all those things. However, we really need to invest in the agents of transformation, including building talent and skills across the entire value chain. And here, the youth, I think, is something that we really need to revisit how we address youth, because they're the more that they, the, well, in terms of the proportion, they're a lot of um, proportion of the population, but also they're the more um, amenable to, 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 to training and, and being trained and, and develop the skills that are needed. For us at FAO, we are positioning ourselves to support this transformation agenda. We have a new strategic narrative, which is, to, which is supporting the transformation to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life, leaving no one behind. And here we have identified four Bs, which is better production, better nutrition, better environment, better life, as I mentioned. These have some of the details. You can see it in a new strategy document. In conclusion, I think, like I've said, there are opportunities, there are challenges. So what are some of the key messages that I'd like to leave this, this, this meeting with? First, as I said earlier on, food and agriculture, they're going to be key if we're going to make any progress on the SDGs and Agenda 2063. Rural development, the rural space, investing in agriculture, crops, livestock, et cetera, they are powerful tools to end poverty and hunger and to obtain the, the door to sustainable agri-food system development. There's tons of evidence about that, I don't think, there are a few people who would disagree with that. We know that, and, and, and it's something that we need to seize. That doesn't mean that other sectors are not important, but we, we cannot make progress in Africa without massive transformation of agri-food systems. Very important that if we're going to achieve this agenda, the rate at which we do so, it will be affected by how successful we are working together. The rate at which it, it will determine that because it's going to take broad partnerships, diverse partnerships, like I said, as I said before, because these agendas are interconnected. So it means that there has to be a lot more sharing of information and knowledge, sharing of technology, sharing of market access across different partners to support countries. The shock from COVID-19 has actually prompted us to rethink the way we produce, process, and consume because the disruptions caused by COVID was global. It affected production, trade, you know, everything, pretty much everything. And, and I think, but what, what we see is that in as much as it was a crisis, every crisis, you know, can provide opportunities. So we're looking at these opportunities and seeing how can we build on the opportunity. We don't want, want, we don't want to waste, waste, pretty much, sorry. We don't want to waste the opportunities that COVID-19 has suggested, but we need to look at things in a different perspective. Because the response and recovery from COVID-19, I think it should heighten our awareness of the urgent need to adopt a holistic and coordinated approach that will allow us to build back better. And finally, at FAO, we are ready and able to support development partners and our member countries. FAO has experience working with development partners and unique expertise. 
in the three dimensions of sustainable development. And we want to, we, we are ready, we stand ready to assist the countries and our partners in implementing in 2030 and agenda 2063. With this, I'll thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Ad, for this um, very well integrated presentation and for presenting the challenges as well as the bright side, as you mentioned. Also, one uh, important point was the missing middle between the global scale and the national uh, capacities and how we need to focus on a holistic approach. I think this was really important. And um, I think now, uh, after uh, seeing the uh, African situation and the different priorities and trends, we can move on with our next presentation about connecting innovation, education, and business creation uh, by Mr. Barbaros. Uh, from this, uh, he is the strategic relationship manager at EIT Food EU. I think the floor is yours. You can share your screen if you prefer. Oops. Yes, I can turn you around. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here today with you. And it's also a great pleasure to be speaking after Ade because. He already run through some of the challenges and actually the approaches that we should be having if, if we are serious about um, reaching the SDGs, because SDGs is for everyone, not for a single country, organization, or a region. We all have to progress towards it, and we can only do this if we work together. And I think that will also be the team and the message that I'd like to share with you today. Um, if we want a future together, we have to work on it together and food is so central. So let's create the future of food together. So that's just a quick intro from, from my side. Um, in the next 15 minutes or so, and I know that we are running out of time, as short of time. So I'll try to be as, as quick as possible. And if you have any questions, I'll be able to, I'll be able to answer also in the chat afterwards. So maybe to start with, um, you can see my screen fully, right? You don't see a blocked side on the, it's all good, right, Nora? No, it's all good, yeah. Great, excellent. So what is EIT? Well, EIT is an EU body that has been established in 2008. It is abbreviated as European Institute of Innovation and Technology. And back then, EIT has been established to become the MIT for Europe. So Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So European Commission wanted was realizing that, okay, a lot of money, a lot of resources going into research, but once the projects are completed, once the, the work is done, it is collecting dust either on the shelves or the research ideas are being exported to other countries and implemented there. So to overcome this, they created EIT um, to basically convert research into action and, into, and bring that to market. And since 2008, for each societal challenge, EIT has been establishing what we call knowledge innovation communities or KICs. So, you know, it started with climate change. That's why we had a climate kick. Then when we had the rare earth minerals crisis, raw materials has been established. When we had the energy, energy political crisis with our neighbors, you know, energy has been established and in the aftermath of the food crisis in 2008 and afterwards the 2015 Milan Expo, the EU has realized that innovation needs to occur and accelerated also in the food systems, in the food system. So we were given a mandate to transform the food systems by the European Union in 2017. Since then, two other sister communities have been established, one on manufacturing and one on urban mobility with a similar mission to transform the sector, to innovate the sector and bring us to the future. And at least from EIT food side, we are doing that. So um, the, the main philosophy of EIT is really bringing together the knowledge triangle and the components of the knowledge triangle. So to bring business, education and research together so that they can innovate together in an open innovation setting and an open innovation mindset. So that with the actions, we actually make entrepreneurs out of students, we turn ideas into products, and we bring science innovation color to the citizens. This is how we are structured. So being an EU body, so of course, there is European Commission, um, with EIT has its own governing board and the headquarters in Budapest, as I mentioned. Then us individual knowledge innovation communities, we are actually independent legal entities. So we have 
a degree of flexibility so we can really innovate being independent of this and that. And since we also have um, education programs, we also have a global network of alumni now, uh, 10,000 now across the globe, really contributing to entrepreneurship innovation. And I will come in a moment, you will understand a little bit better what we mean by partners, internet games, and everything like that. So established in 2017, um, within a matter of four years, EA Food has actually become the world's largest food innovation ecosystem. And we are, we are working with a mantra and a mandate to make, to build a food system, a food system of the future where everyone can have access to sustainable, safe and healthy food from, with trust and fairness from farm to fork. And really for this purpose, we work with everyone and we are open to working with everyone because innovation and the future of food systems is not in monopoly of one actor or the other. We all have to work together, brainstorm together, collaborate together, pull resources together, pull ideas together to advance innovation. So I think Ari has mentioned this quite clearly, like nutrition is so essential for the success, for achievement of all the SDGs. Um, and again, as I said in the very beginning, food and SDGs is not only for one country, one region, one continent. No, it's for all of us. And we all have to progress and we all have to get where we need to be. So that's why it, especially taking into account the looming age of austerity, inflation, this and that, where resources will be scarce. The only way we can succeed is if we collaborate together, if we come together, if we avoid duplications, and if we really put innovation out there that benefits us all. So this is really a quick slide at the moment. So we have about 230 partners that collaborate with us, that innovate with us. Uh, these are large, large scale industry, SMEs. We have about 70 startups that we work day in and day out. And over any year, we support 200 startups. We have universities with us. We have higher education institutes with us. We have civil society with us, consumer organizations uh, and resource centers. And together, by actually connecting these actors together, the, the different actors on the knowledge triangle, we are able to really deliver impactful solutions that could be scaled across the globe to transform the food system. So how we are doing this, we have really six objectives, right? So one of them is of course, to be able to work in innovation and to be able to ensure that innovation finds a market and is taken up by its users, you have to work on trust. Um, so we are working really hard to work on trust. I, I'll have some examples. The other one is creating consumer valued healthy foods. Another one is of course, embedding digitalization and really connecting the food system, different components of food system together, enhancing sustainability, educating not only the professionals, not only the researchers, but the citizens, the users of the technology, the farmers, and really overcoming the skills gap in the food system. And lastly, catalyzing entrepreneurship, really reinforcing, supporting those entrepreneurs so that their solutions can come to market so that we really dynamize the, the society a little bit, the sector a little bit. So I mentioned, we work on the principle of knowledge triangle, connecting different uh, components. But when we talk about Food, food is so central that we said, okay, connecting the tree, so business, um, research, and um, higher education is not enough. We also have to connect people if you would like to innovate food. So that's why we say, okay, we actually square the triangle, and these actually become our four areas of intervention and four types of uh, interventions that we develop. So we developed educational modules, education solutions. We develop innovation solutions. We, we support entrepreneurs and support entrepreneurial activities. And we work with citizens. Um, so the slides will be available to you. And if actually on this slide, if you click on different solutions, and now we have actually more than 200 solutions already in place in our portfolio, you can also visit our website. You'll be able to see actually what is created as a result of a collaborative action between different knowledge triangle partners. 
So chose few of them. For education, we, we have developed with our partners again, um, a master's program. We organize summer schools across the world. We organize, actually, we, we develop actually massive open online courses that are free of charge that anyone can follow on their own speed. Um, and these are all available on our website. We support SMEs there. So we have a range of education activities that we work on. And on the screen now, you see actually a screenshot of some of the, only some of the open courses that we have available, accessible, um, uh, that we have developed in these past four years. It ranges from really about how to ensure feed quality, how to improve poultry sector to, you know, how does our brain work when we eat food? So how shall we approach food? What is trust? How can farmers produce food more sustainably? And this is all again, all accessible. Another thing that we have developed and, and we are quite proud of is in the last six months, we have been working with students, organizations around the way, across the world, like Harvard Chain, our partners, to develop an educational module for medical school students. Um, medical school students through the course of their entire education only receive maybe four, maximum eight hours of education on nutrition actually. And when you think that actually our doctors, medicals, they're actually our health advisors, it was a quite a gap that they don't know much about food, about nutrition, something so critical for our health. So we have developed this module of 13 hours, additional hours, um, and actually we'll be making this course available at the occasion of the pre-summit in Rome in July. And we'll also run a second module, again, free of charge in October after the UN Food System Summit. I'm also very happy to say that we, for example, had some Egyptian students also working with us in designing this educational module. So our approach is also co-creation because you have to co-create the solution with the end user if you want it to be taken up later on, if you really want to make an impact. And with this, for example, we were with a group of students from um, Egypt and I believe some 60 students from also the continent of Africa participated in the pilot run, providing us feedback as to what can be improved so on and so forth. Innovation, of course, a big area, and uh, previous speakers have mentioned this quite clearly, the world will not be a similar place after COVID. We have to build back better. So while we are, how we are approaching innovation is we are really collecting insights from the market as to what needs to change, what are the trends, what are the emerging teams, and we are developing technological solutions on six focus areas, right? These are alternative proteins, sustainable agriculture, targeted nutrition, sustainable aquaculture, digitalization and traceability and circularity. And of course, consumer centricity is critical and cross-cutting across all similarly to the digitalization. One of the things that we developed, for example, another solution that we developed and we'll make it available in the coming months is an environmental label that we can put on the food products that can really show in a dynamic fashion how that food scores in relation to the environment. And since it's not a static model, it really collects data from gate, from, from farm to fork. It can really out change from one day to the next, also providing incentives for producers to produce more sustainably so that, and, and for consumers to, to choose a better option. Um, another activity that we do, and again, all this is part of more than 200 solutions that we produced in the past four years, three years, um, is our Empowering Women in Agri-Food program. And really here we are supporting female farmers, visionaries, scientists, doers, agronomists, chemists, the women who really have an interest and stake in food production. And we equip them with the necessary skills, but also provide financial support so that they can bring these ideas to market or they can become the leaders of food product, tomorrow's food system. Now, I have gone through our education programs, mentioned a few things about the innovation activities um, and for startups. So, Maybe I go to the next slide. So we really support entrepreneurs 
at every step of their journey. They can be students, you know, just at the university having studying agronomy. They could have an idea, but they might lack the resources to, to create a company, to, to start their own business. So we really start supporting them from that stage, then take them into incubator, accelerator. We have our own venture fund that we are building now with our partners. If they're really successful with their solution, and if the solution is really impactful, we have a, our group of startups, and this is the 70 I mentioned at the beginning, whom we call rising food stars. So these are really scale-ups that could really shake up the food sector. We take them in, we provide them dedicated support and actually treat them as equal partners as large industry to, to scale their uh, solutions to market and, and ensure their growth. And for everyone, all entrepreneurs around the world, we also organize annually venture summits where, okay, we support to a certain level, but our support is not enough. So we also give them the opportunity to attract support from externals so that the, the impact can be accelerated forward, going forward. Well, trust I mentioned is an important element also of EIT food. And I think we are running a little bit out, out of time. We also measuring food and truly insights that we collect from consumers, from citizens as to what are the underlying conditions of trust. We are also then developing solutions to improve that trust also in the system. For example, we develop transparency methods because consumers are demanding it to be more trusting to the food sector, so on and so forth. So I'm just going to go into details. The slides will be available to you. But what I want to say is, of course, EIT Food is an EU organization established but, uh, by the European Union, supported by the European Union. But we are, of course, not confined to the European Union. Um, we are already collaborating. I'm oh, sorry, what I want to say here is the challenges, again, this will be a repetition, the challenges that we are facing are common. It's not only EU's challenges, it's not only Africa's challenges, it's not only about Latin America, it's all our challenges. And we, we have to work together. So for that, um, we are actually, we started establishing platform to platform collaboration with organizations to do things together, to accelerate, scale things further. We have a collaboration in Brazil. We have now uh, established a collaboration with the World Economic Forum for the 100 million farmers, 1 billion consumers uh, transition to zero nature positive food systems. We are training farmers on regenerative agriculture. And just to say this, that we are open to also collaborating with, with platforms, with countries from Africa. As a matter of fact, we're also thinking actually of opening an innovation hub in Africa but this or that, what I want to say is we are happy to replicate our success also in Africa, collaborating with you all. So um, I will not go through this in the interest of time. So all just to say, let's create the future of food together. Let's collaborate together in an open innovation setting. Let's not reinvent the wheel because we are running out of time. We only have eight harvests left until 2030. And if we, we can only succeed, I'm really serious about this, if we work together. So this is an invitation to all of you. Let's work together and thanks for listening to me. Well, thank you, Barbara, so much for this uh, excellent presentation. It was very informative on your activities in EIT Food and your approach. And I think it's similar to what we're trying to do in Leave for FNSSA, and it would be a very good chance that we can collaborate together. And like you said, we need to work together. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. So I think that was a very informative presentation. I think you already have questions, but I would prefer that we go further with the presentations and then have a final open discussion. Uh, thank you so much. And I will, will just share my screen. So now with a very interesting presentation on uh, the role of private sector and how we can catalyze the involvement in the partnership. Uh, by uh, Amr Sabahi, the general manager of Sikkim Agriculture. He has a PhD degree in agricultural sciences, faculty of uh, agriculture in uh, Banha, Egypt, University of uh, Agriculture Engineering Department, uh, studies on design and management of soilless culture systems. He has a master's degree in agricultural sciences, uh, also from the same university, uh, and studies on raceway fish farming system. He has a bachelor's degree 
Contemporary University in Egypt. Um, he is now the general manager for agriculture sector in the SICOM group. Uh, he is also a technical, he was also a technical support manager for a Mizan company for organic uh, grafting. And uh, he was also a production manager for Libra for organic production, compost production facility. He was also the head of agriculture sector um, in El Naina company. And uh, finally, he was also an agriculture engineering research institute, um, part of the institute and the research ARC, agriculture research center in Egypt and an engineer in the Agriculture Technology Transfer Department. Uh, it's our pleasure to have you today with us, Dr. Ram. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Shall I share my screen? Um, if you prefer, I can share it for you, or if you prefer to share it yourself, it's fine. Yes, I, I, I want to share because I... Okay. Yes, please go on. Yeah. On uh, behalf of the uh, SICAM community, I wanted to thank you for your invitation today to be uh, with you in this event. Today, I'll speak about SICAM initiative as a private sector uh, in sustainable development. Uh, uh, field. So I'll start now. SICAM initiative. SICAM is, is a translation uh, from an ancient, ancient Egyptian hieroglyph means vitality. Uh, SICAM initiative established in 1977 uh, was funded by Dr. Ibrahim Abu Laish. To realize the vision of sustainable human development. SICAM aims to contribute to the comprehensive development of the individual society and the environment. Uh, a holistic concept encompassing inter, uh, integrated economic, social, and cultural development forms the key SICAM vision. There are some facts about and figures, figures about SICAM. Uh, SICAM working on 15,000 hectares, including the suppliers. Also, SICAM serve about 800 small farmers. Uh, we own eight companies. The number of our employees is 2,500. Our beneficiaries about 25,000. We sequestrate about 1 million ton CO2. Our vision sustainable development toward a future where every human being can unfold his or her individual potential, where mankind is living in social form reflecting human dignity, and where all economic activity is conducted in accordance with ecological and the ethical principles. To achieve our, this vision, we, we had to work in different uh, dimensions, in all the dimensions, like uh, uh, social dimension, economic dimension, cultural dimension, because sustainable, it's, it's a holistic uh, meaning. I can't work in one dimension and leave the others. And you will see uh, uh, all these dimensions. We have a video in the, uh, at the end of this presentation. We'll, uh, I'll share it with you. We'll watch to this video together. And you will find all these dimensions in this uh, video. Of course, uh, uh, SICAM doesn't work 
uh, alone, we started in 1977. From uh, the beginning, Dr. Ibrahim has uh, a, a wide uh, range of relationships, and also he started many, parten uh, many partnerships with different uh, companies. Uh, like uh, uh, like uh, GLS Bank, uh, Toritis Bank, uh, International Association for uh, Partnership. So what we will see, uh, I think it's a result of a successful partnership between SICAM and other uh, countries and the other, and, uh, and the, uh, other companies. SICAM has about eight companies. SICAM uh, Holding, of course, in the, in the top. Atos, SICAM, uh, Libra, Hathor, Aziz, Mizan, Lotus, Salas, Nature Text. All these companies is a daughter company for SICAM. SICAM Holding, SICAM Holding was established in 2001. SICAM Group. Uh, of companies are all under the umbrella of SICAM Holding. Atos established in 1986 uh, as a pharmaceutical joint venture between German company and the also SICAM. Uh, it produced medicines, medicines uh, using natural uh, ingredients in accordance with good manufacturing practice. Also, there is a many a many products for uh, for artists like hair care, uh, medicinal tea, and another product. Second farm established in 1979 uh, as a processing company for all kinds of herbs, spices for biodynamic cultivated plants. Herbs spices are cleaned and classified through different process according to the needs of the uh, customers and the international Demeter processing guideline. This is uh, second farm products. Hathor, Hathor established in 1996 as a backing company for organic fresh fruits and vegetables according to needs of different clients also. Their, its products, fruits, vegetables, is this, it's the biggest company in SICAM, established in 1997, as a company for manufacturing and backing all food products and beverage. All of these products are made from organically certified raw material, in addition to this, no chemical additives or uh, anything uh, presentative are used during the processing. Nature Tix, Nature Tix established in 1994 <clears throat> is an organic cotton produce, uh, producer of paper, children under and uh, sleepwear. Mizan established in, in, in 2005 as an organic selling producer. It's between group group Holland and the second group, and you can say this is the, the, the successful story of partnership between uh, uh, group Holland and uh, in Mizan because we uh, succeed to transfer technology from Holland to Egypt. And he was a pioneer in this time in this technique, and we, uh, and the, uh, we succeed to spread this technique. Uh, around the Egypt now. Lotus established in 2005 as a dried organic herbs and spices uh, uh, producers, products, uh, natural chemical free products, herbs, spices. And also there is uh, two, two foundations which serve all uh, uh, workers in Seacombs and our neighbors also. Egyptian uh, Biodynamic Association, and this association serve all uh, farmers which are grow, which are working in organic field in Egypt. Uh, 
uh, as, uh, uh, provide biodynamic search and extension service to farmers all over Egypt. Uh, also, EBDA provides the training and expertise needed to enable a farmer to have his land inspected and certified as organic according to EU standards. Second, Development Foundation also this serve uh, uh, and introduce uh, uh, medical uh, service and the education for neighbors and our uh, for, for our worker and our neighbors. Second society, we have uh, uh, also schools uh, from kindergarten under uh, uh, to uh, uh, secondary school. Uh, also, we have Heliopolis uh, University. Uh, we have also medicinal medical center, research center. Heliopolis. Uh, university for sustainable development. I think this is the, the last stone which Dr. Ibrahim bought it in, in his uh, uh, dream uh, was the Holyobulus University. Uh, it's a vision Holyobulus University strive for sustainable development of individuals, the communities and the nature in Egypt and the world. Mission of the Holyobulus University at Holyobulus University, we empower our students to be the champions of sustainable development in different uh, spheres of life. We provide a place where a new idea made a fertile ground for further research and teaching. Our education uh, combines teaching, research, and practice with a uniquely humanistic core program, developing curious and the creative mind. Fact is, and the figure for in, in, in Heliopolis University, uh, Dr. Ibrahim founded uh, a way forward for SICAM initiative. Uh, uh, Dr. Ibrahim established this university in 2012 uh, with five faculties and 1,500 uh, 1, students the first university in the Middle East and North Africa uh, declaring sustainable development as its overall guiding uh, principle. The university has established a quality system customized to Holyobus uh, University values. There is a student forum every Monday where there is a good uh, chance for students to present their achievement uh, in different uh, syllabus. Of course, so we, 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 this is five faculties which we have, Faculty of Engineer, Faculty of Pharmacy, Faculty of uh, Business, Faculty of uh, Physiotherapy, Faculty of Agriculture, and uh, uh, Sustainable Development. This is vision for uh, SECAM in 2075. SICAM is International Center for Excellence for Holistic, Sustainable, Individual, Organizational, Social Development and the Social Innovation in Egypt, which is an inspiring development organization worldwide in all dimensions. Uh, actually, I want also to share with you this video if it's possible, it will be great also to see this video about SECAM. Can you hear this? Mm. Can you hear? No, we can't. You can't? Excuse me. Um, if you like, you can just share the link in the chat and then everyone would have a chance to okay, I, see it afterwards. So I can share. Yes, we already shortened and done. I think if you can share it, then everyone can. Okay, I'll, sh I'll, I'll share a link. I'll share a link with all to see this video because uh, this video includes all what, what uh, we have and what we uh, uh, achieved in SICAM. Yeah, I would like to thank you for the presentation. I think it was a very uh, good example on how the private sector could invest in uh, 
sustainable agriculture, also in education and research and linking uh, everything together. And also uh, similar to what Barbaros was uh, mentioning the IT presentation on how we can link uh, research innovation and uh, education and also include the public. I think this is a good example also I know about the university and um, how we encourage students to uh, do research projects and actually implement their own ideas. So I think this was a very good example on how the private sector could uh, mobilize this uh, holistic approach that we are trying to reach. Thank you, Dr. Ram, Thank so you. much. Uh, now we have uh, our final presentation. Uh, knowledge co-creation in agriculture and food-related multi-stakeholder platforms in Sub-Saharan Africa by Edith uh, Van Evick, uh, postdoc researcher at Dutch University of Technology and University of uh, Amsterdam, Netherlands. Uh, it's really nice to have you here with us today. Um, as I said, she's currently uh, analyzing interprofessional and transdisciplinary learning for sustainable transitions. Uh, in port area development. She's also trained as a geographer at the University of Amsterdam, where she recently completed a postdoc research on knowledge brokering and co-creation in agriculture and food-related multi-stakeholder partnerships in sub-Saharan Africa. And she also works as a lecturer at the University of Amsterdam and has ample working experience outside the academia in the field of sustainable development, international cooperation, research communication, text writing, and evaluation. And the floor is yours, Alice. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, for having me. And also apologies that I was not able um, to, to participate in the full event as I had other obligations. Um, but I'm happy um, to be the final present presenter for today. Um, and I mainly draw on my work on the University of Amsterdam, which I recently completed and a specific research which was called Putting Heads Together um, and which was funded by NWO World Row Science for Global Development in the Netherlands um, under a specific, specific call which was called the Science for Using Research Call. And when we set off with this research project, we uh, found that uh, food and agricultural related multi-stakeholder platforms that they were increasing in numbers and that they were also seen as important vehicles to address challenges related to agriculture, food security, uh, and sustainable and inclusive development. And at the same time, we felt that it was insufficiently clear what kind of factors influence those multi-stakeholder platforms, like, for example, hey, the dynamics, uh, how the cross-sector learning was actually happening, and whether or not it also leads to a sustainable change. And when researchers were, were, were engaged, if it also resulted in the uptake of research findings. So that's why we uh, set off with this project. The next slide, please. Um, and just to be clear what we are talking about, um, I use multi-stakeholder platforms and you will find me uh, uh, using MSPs as an abbreviation. I try to be very sparse with using abbreviations, but I think this one is quite common. And these are um, the platforms where actually policymakers, farmers, knowledge brokers, private sector, NGOs, and researchers are actually coming together pre corona, also mostly uh, physically uh, as well, um, in order to exchange knowledge um, and learn from each other with the idea that everybody has their own set of valuable knowledge and that actually the knowledge from researcher is not like superior to other kind of knowledge. So farmers also have their own knowledge, which is can be as, as valuable as other kinds of knowledge. Um, the multi-stakeholder platform we looked at, these were platforms where researchers actually were actively engaged. So I know you've also, for example, have public-private uh, partnerships without, for example, the role of researchers, which we excluded from this research. Next slide, please. Um, the research project consisted out of two main parts. First, a systematic literature review on multi-stakeholder platforms in sub-Saharan Africa, agriculture food related specifically, and uh, empirical research. Um, and I looked at two 
main projects um, where the University of Amsterdam was engaged in. And the one, first one was the inclusive value chain collaboration project, which looked at uh, oil palm and cocoa farmers in Ghana and in South Africa at, um, at um, avocado and macadamia farmers. Um, and the tree farms project in Ghana, which looked at reforestation schemes where farmers were actually encouraged to introduce uh, non-timber forest species like spices and honey, for example. These products were both funded by also by the same organization, NWO Wotro. So you could see actually the pudding heads to get a product built on the two other research projects. And next slide, please. Um, I'm sorry that I can't, I don't have much time to go into the details of the methodology of the systematic literature review. And maybe not all of you are also equally interested in, in it, but I just want to share the main principles. It uses a very clear and well-defined scope and a very systematic way of looking at the literature. Um, and, you, and with this um, strategy, you try to be as complete as possible and to collect all the relevant evidence on a specific topic. And you also look at the quality of scientific articles. So at the end, you try to arrive, arrive at a very strong evidence base so that you can really be, uh, have strong research findings which you can build on. Um, when we started off the research, we started with scanning more than 2,000 articles, which could be potential relevant. And at the end, we ended with 32 slash 3 scientific articles and 48 prey literature studies. It might be interesting to know, I said I'm focusing on sub-Sahara Africa, and we, we first included the whole world, but we had too many hits, and we found no publications really on the northern part of Africa. And as the empirical research was also focusing on sub-Sahara Africa, we argued we can focus on sub-Sahara Africa, but I think the findings are as relevant for also a northern, northern Africa, including Egypt. Next slide, please. I just want to go straight to the key findings. And the first finding was that we found that Dutch academic researchers played quite an important role in setting up, facilitating, and also researching these platforms. And they were mainly supported by research programs in the Netherlands, which has a specific aim of still stimulating knowledge co-creation. And we also found that um, there were several positive results so in general, we had quite some positive results on the results of uh, multi-stakeholder platforms. These were, for example, policy change, changes, which, for example, has, um, facilitated sustainable development, but also were helpful for smallholder farmers. And we found that um, the multi-stakeholder platforms led to an increased yields and income, specifically for smallholder farmers, and also to a more sustainable agricultural practices, and also avoiding some harmful practices. Um, influences factors were re related to the community level, for example, social capital, which were put in or the available resources. Uh, the implementation process was important, whether or not clear objectives were set that really mattered uh, when you looked at the results. And also what was important if, for example, a faci good facilitator was included, that also was helpful. The context also mattered like the political political commitment and the support of policies which were not which were in place or not. Next slide, slide please. Um, we also found that most multi-stakeholder platforms were op operational at the local level, for example, the district level, um, and there were limitations in scaling up these platforms. So if there are some persistent problems at the local level which need support from national policies, they uh, had limited effect in general. I'm not, it doesn't apply for all multi-stakeholder platforms, but in general. So they had limitations in, in achieving structural changes. Also, we found that most platforms, platforms were donor-driven, at least the one we included in our study, and that sustaining initiatives uh, of the results of those platforms was sometimes a challenge. It was also difficult to research as in most of the platforms, actually action researchers were engaged and there were hardly any um, um, articles which took a longer term perspective or which revisited some of the initiatives after product closure. 
Um, and lastly, we found there was limited evidence on the effectiveness of M M of the multi-stakeholder platform. So there were hardly any studies which really looked at the costs and the results or which compared them to other initiatives. initiatives. But still, yeah, the, the results were in generally quite positive um, when you looked at income and um, um, sustainable practices. Next slide. Um, just to highlight empirical research, um, I al already mentioned the two projects. And the, the methodology was action research, where actually I participated in learning platforms and communities of practice meeting. These are two kinds of multi-stakeholder platforms, which were organized in the framework of the two projects. I participated in meetings uh, in order to prepare uh, learning platforms and communities of practice meetings. I interviewed the, viewed the main actors involved organized focus group discussions, and we also uh, organized dissemination and validation workshops. Um, I highlight some of the results in Ghana. This is the map of Ghana. And if you can go one slide uh, next. And this is the, uh, the map of the research area. And actually, I must acknowledge my um, esteemed colleague, Kwabena Asubonteng, who drew this map. Um, you see here, um, the green spot is the the part where the tree farms project was operational, um, the purple one was where both projects were operational, and the brownish uh, spots is where the inclusive value chain projects were operational. So there was some overlap, but there were also some specific regions. Next slide. Um, and it just, I don't, I'm going to skip this slide a little bit. I just want to mention that. Um, the multi stakeholder platforms which were organized in this framework of the project were really grounded also in research findings on inclusive development. With, uh, with um, had a general finding that's important to recognize that farmers' uh, local knowledge needs to be included. And that also different kind of knowledge should be combined in order to find um, challenges, solutions, sorry, to challenges related to poverty food insecurity on sustainable farming and climate change. Um, so the farmer-centered approach in these two products, um, we consider the learning as being potential inclusive when the knowledge exchange was al aligned with the farmers for for right, uh, the varied livelihoods, their orientations, their knowledge, their experience, the capabilities and innovation capacity. And when and the, the project achieves more equi equitable outcomes and self-determination of farmers, and whether, whether, when they also took a sustainable and landscape concerns into account, so also inclusive towards the landscapes and the environment. These are just two photos uh, to show so that you have a little bit idea how these platforms look like in practice. This were, this were um, a possible platform in Tepa, Ghana, um, um, organized in July 2018. Um, and you see some farmers who were identified as potential change makers who brought in their low tech um, and low cost knowledge, their innovations, which they found uh, for persistent problems and which they shared with other farmers in the room, but also with institutional stakeholders. And, we, and um, half of the participants were actually were farmers and that helped um, them in feeding, um, to being able to speak more freely. If you have only two or three farmers and then, for example, 20 institutional actors, some farmers might uh, feel some hurdles to raise their voice. But in this composition, farmers really spoke out. Okay, next slide. And this is another uh, photo of a uh, learning platform in Kade in Ghana, where um, actually uh, farmers were questioning um, practices from the policy policymakers, so they were raising all kinds of questions and also hold other uh, actors into um, accountable. In this case, um, an oil palm a company. And there was a free exchange between all those actors. Next slide. Um, and just want to highlight the key findings of those uh, platforms and the learning platforms and the, and the, uh, the community of practice made meetings. Well, we first we found that providing a safe place for farmers to share the knowledge with peers and other actors really make them feel included and empowered. This is something we witnessed, but we also heard from the farmers themselves 
and from the institutional actors who had long-standing working relations with the farmers. Um, the farmers adopted practices which were shared by their peers during the platform meetings. And this is something which I heard from all the farmers and the institutional actors. Um, and there, were, uh, there are many examples, like one farmer said, well, I introduced other practices and I learned not to rely on only one activity to also in order to increase my food security. People started planting more trees. Um, for, they started saving schemes, for example. So the, the, what they took up was, was really varied. Um, but there were a lot of examples like this. Um, organizing the flat platforms at district level also en enhanced engagements of actors closely working with the farmers. And they already had established uh, relationships with the farmers, but they learned from, um, the, from the knowledge from the farmers. It was also a way to um, explain policies farmers um, had a better overview of all the institutional actors, so they knew where they uh, could go to. Um, and sometimes farms also experienced that they, were, that they received different kind of match messages from different kind of institutional actors. For example, like um, the, the space of planting um, trees, for example. So it also helped to solve of some of those um, different conflicting messages. Next slide, please. Um, several local actors took ownership of the platform principles, principles but um, it was challenging to continue the multi-stakeholder platform after project closure. And actually, uh, institutional actors were quite critical. They felt that they needed more support in order to sustain the platform themselves, and that uh, specific, specifically applied in the area. But at the same time, there was also cross-learning um, by, um, by actors which were engaged and which took up the learning platform in other geographical settings. So um, yeah, it was the, the, the concept was uh, applied, but not necessarily in the same area. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, to conclude, um, we said that the inclusive, inclusive value chain and um, Free farms project they used the farmer centered approach that was inclusive um, as knowledge exchange was effectively effectively aligned with farmers very to a livelihood orientation their knowledge experience and cap capabilities innovation capacity that there are also strong indications that the product achieves more equitable outcomes and self-determination for farmers who could easily adopt low tech and low low cost innovations which they learned from their peers and their indications that it also improved to their uh, well-being. Uh, most practices taken up were well in line with sustainable and sustainability and landscape concerns. Next slide. There is an important, uh, however, so there were key challenges and limitations. We felt that the potential um, of the multi-stakeholder platforms and the pooling of knowledge was not sufficiently used, so it was mainly a knowledge exchange, but not so much really coming up to novel solutions. And there was a restricted participation of crucial actors at higher scale levels. So it can limit the change at the district level and more structural changes at higher policy levels. And there was a limited number of meetings um, which could be organized if there was limited interactions among the participants in between the meetings. Um, and it is also, again, yeah, this is mainly related to financial constraints and limited capacity. And also we felt that the donor dependency of the platforms, which resulted in challenges to continue with organizing the learning platform after product closure. So I have two links if you would like to have more information. One article based on the systematic literature review and a paper um, we recently presented at a conference uh, Africa Knows um, last uh, January. And there's also a project website if you are interested. So uh, yeah, then the last slide is I think a thank you. <laughs> thank you for your attention. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Edith, so much for this uh, very informative presentation and for sharing the results of your research and the perspective of the farmers as well. I think it was a very uh, good presentation to end our uh, 
event today. Uh, just before we go to the final comments and discussion, I would like to ask all the panelists and speakers to just open the, the camera for a one screenshot or a group photo, virtual group photo, if it's possible. Yes, perfect. Thank you. I think now we can move to uh, the final comments. Uh, I think we're short in time. I'm not sure if there are uh, some questions. I think they were already answered uh, mostly by Barbaros from EIT Foods. I'm not sure if there are more questions. So I guess we can move to the final comments. Uh, Philippe, if you're there, you can take it from here. Okay. Th thank you, Noron. Um I mean, before I, before I move to the final comments, I think it's... Um, it was very impressive, all the, uh, all the presentation, all the experience that has been uh, um, put forward. And I think we can, we can learn a lot from, from what has been, has been presented. I, I hope also that also through this discussion, uh, we have, we, I, I'm saying, as Leap for FNC project, we understand better what others have done and we can make these contacts and uh, Gain from your experience, and also we have created about some awareness about the uh, the IRC platform that we will launch, and maybe some interest to to join. I know there were some comments here in in the chat, so if uh, if people are interested to know more more about this IRC platform, you should not hesitate to look at our website and then uh, uh, contact uh, con contact me or or, or contact. Uh, through through the website, but we will we will uh, we'll follow up on this. Um, I know making final comments after such risk presentation is is always risky because I I can only really I cannot really um, uh, let's say take the whole value of, of of what has been presented. But I, I've just sort of picked up eight points uh, which which I would like to, to bring forward and, and more or less um, following the, the presenters. Um, we got from from Jonas Mugabe from PFAD some very uh, interesting learning that I think has been most of it incorporated into what the vision we have for the IRC platform. I think uh, um, Jonas insisted a lot on the question of the balance and equitable partnership, uh, partnership which is not only open to research partners, but, but goes beyond research partners and goes beyond public partners as well. I think that, that, that's been taken on board and that's very important. Um, there was a lot also about uh, some, I mean, I like some of the expressions, uh, uh, let's look for the new research funding mechanism that can be small but flexible, a lot can be achieved with small funding, but if the momentum is kept, uh, I think that there is a lot of truth in this. Um, um, PayPal explored a sort of stage-wise support system for, for project from starting from an initial idea, then develop the idea, then, then uh, get it, let it grow and we get it bigger, which is quite similar to what some other Funders are doing like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in the way they develop their proposal, which sometimes leads to multi-million projects, but start with a with a, a five thousand or ten thousand sort of concept note or ideas. So it's a stepwise process, um, which I think is interesting. In in Lib Five and SSA, there is a specific task within Work Package Two, working on uh, this question of funding how to develop new funding mechanism that could be have this flexibility uh, and also have the ability to keep the momentum and to connect with the 
not only with pub public funding, but with private funding. So uh, I think we're also trying to get the learning from PayPal into feeding those activities of uh, LeapFrog and SSA. So that's, that's the second point about funding, and I think it's, it's, it's a key one. Uh, the third one is that, that we learned from PayPal was the importance of the information, uh, the, the D group, there's also reference to a, a knowledge management system. I think uh, Jonas referred to Osiris. And uh, in fact, in Leap for FNC, say we are building upon this one. Uh, the name has changed, but we stay within the Egyptians because it's now Chaos. So from Osiris to Chaos. But we were building, building on this. One challenge for uh, the EU, AU uh, FNSC platform uh, is, is that we are in a partnership looking for impact on both continents, on both sides. And that's a challenge when we move to, in PayPal, there was the user-led process and the user was really users in Africa. And I'll come back to this point because I think that was one of the uh, uh, highlight of what Edit uh, Dan Ewick also said. How can we adapt, transform the user-led process from the case of PayPal or the case of the project where uh, the multi-stakeholder platform where Edit was working to the situation where the users or the final beneficiaries are on both continents, are not only farmers in Africa, but could be on both sides. So I think I'll come back to this issue because I think that's probably a challenging one and we need we need inputs and, and good ideas. Um, thanks, uh, Marino Carvalho. I mean, I, 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 managed, I noted quite a few important elements. The question of a digital platform, and as you presented it, a platform has to have a digital component because it enables to reach out to more people, to reach wide to more actors, to more people. But it's not only digital. As, as you were presenting in, um, uh, in, 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 your, in your project, there is the digital side, but there is also the, the actions being done, uh, producing policy papers and an action plan and so. So I think that's also a good, a good idea, a good recommendation, and we'll take this on board. Um, the IRC platform will have a digital component for information, for um, enabling people to reach information, to reach contact, but it, it will not be only a, a digital platform. So thanks, thanks for this. Um, maybe a comment, I mean, in the presentation by Adi Freeman and, and Barbados Korikoglu, uh, there were quite a few elements in common related to the SDGs, uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, and the, uh, the need for transformation through innovation. And I, I don't know whether people are, are aware, but the, um, uh, the EU and the AU are, have launched a specific working group on innovation. So it's part of the agenda of both unions when they look at research and innovation in their partnership, the focus on innovation. But that group was started after the one on FNSSF on food, nutrition, security, and sustainable agriculture. There is another one on climate change and energy. But the third one was innovation as a cost-cutting issues. And I think it was, it's, it's good to have highlighted what Barbaros you did on the, uh, the EIT food. Uh, innovation is key to uh, the transformation of agri-food system. Actually, transformation of agri-food system is an expression that both uh, Ade and Barbaros you, you use. And I very welcome this. Uh, it's now being the, the, the new keyword for the EU AU partnership is called the green transition or sometimes called the green transformation. Green because it's addressing um, the challenge of climate change, the need for change, the need for um, looking at all externalities, but also the notion of building back better, which, which has been mentioned. I just opened a, a short parenthesis here on in, in Leap 5 and SSA, there has been a a very uh, high quality workshop recently on the resilience of food system in Europe and in Africa, which has highlighted uh, the cost-cutting issues for the partnership between the two continents. And I think we will continue building on, building on this one. Uh, I also like in both presentation, uh, Adi and Barbaros, you also uh, highlighted that there was uh, 
but it's a lot happening in Africa. Africa is innovating. There is a lot of new ideas. There are a lot of new business and research partners and opportunities. So I think that's that's also a very uh, important message that we also try to to build up in the uh, in the IRC platform. Uh, and briefly, just to to, uh, to to last point, I don't want to extend for too long. Um, Amer Sabahi, I think that was interesting. Uh, you, you showed the importance of of connections, but also an example of a social innovation. And I think that's that's very important. We always tend to think innovation first as technological innovation, but you showed a good example of a social innovation led by the private sectors investing in education. And in a way, social innovation, multi-stakeholder platform is a kind of social innovation as well. And, and Edith, that was your, 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 your uh, your, your highlights on this aspect of the multi-stakeholder platform. Um, I think we, uh, from a project back, uh, from project point of view, uh, it would be interesting to, to connect uh, with you, Edit, on a number of issues and mostly on what you presented as how can we learn more on the commu community of practices. That's probably something where within the IRC platform, there should be community of practices should they be, they be based on constituencies of, of stakeholders? Should they be based on specific regions? I mean, how to, to, to make this work? I think that's, that's uh, something we would like to probably to engage in further discussions. And also you, you're presenting the farmer, center, farmer centers approach. And here again, it leads to the same question that we would have to work with PayPal in the user-led process. How can we adapt a user-led process or a farmer center approach to a case where we are a partnership between two continents and we need to have on board farmers from Europe and farmers from Africa, both of them at the center. Uh, and a user-led process where users will be policymakers from both continents, will be researchers from both continents. How can we put them at the center and build on this so that they lead, lead the process uh, in both continents and not only in just one of the two. That's, I think, is probably a, a challenge. I don't think it has been uh, done in the past, but all your experience and, and uh, the learning that you developed uh, should, should help to do that. So for me, a lot of um, confirmation of elements that we, we are taking on board uh, uh, are good ideas to move forward and a few questions where we probably need to uh, uh, contact you again and further work. Um, but we are not launching this ISC platform tomorrow. We, we have time. We have time to elaborate, co-design it with all the, the good willing. And uh, so we'll surely be, be contacting you and, and uh, engaging in this discussion in the future. Noran, back, back to you. Yes, thank you, Philippe, so much for uh, summarizing the key messages of the event. I think today we had very interesting presentations from all our speakers, which were very informative, and I think they all showed, uh, like you said, goodwill in co-designing this platform. We have time, and we want this to be a first step in further and future communication and collaboration. Um, I just want to thank all the presenters, and I would like to thank uh, the attendees as well. Uh, also the, my colleagues for um, helping in uh, organize such an event from CM Barry and from Sirad and from Farah as well. I think uh, this was a good uh, fruitful event and I hope that we can build on, on the outcomes of such an event. Uh, please note that this event is recorded and it uh, the presentations and the, um, the video will be uploaded on our official website as well. And we also want to uh, invite you to one of our upcoming events that would be uh, really interesting. It's the FNSSA Stakeholder Engagement Week that will take place from the 31st of May till the 4th of June. And you can find more information on the official website uh, of Leap for FNSSA. And please don't hesitate to contact us via email or uh, uh, through the website to uh, just know the updates and the news. You can also subscribe to our newsletter. Please also know that we have another event uh, that will be based on the discussions of today on the 22nd of June. Uh, 
the second dissemination event. Please follow the website to know all the, uh, the updates. And I would like to thank you all for participating today and for taking part in our event. And please um, follow us and participate in the future ones because we want you um, as a part of this platform and in co-designing as well as just participating. So please stay in touch. I would like to thank you all. And have a good day. Bye. Thanks for the thank you all. Thank you, Nora. Goodbye. Good day. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Goodbye.